Welcome, welcome once again. Tonight is a special night. We have Onia scheduled on uh, tonight, and he is going to be talking about uh, biblical chronology, the different textual traditions, and uh, we're going to be talking about how the different dates within the different manuscripts uh, vary, and which one. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure we're going to have to, we're going to have some questions. Which one is the most accurate? Okay, so let's see what we got here in the chat first. Um, we have one John two twenty six. Good evening and shalom. Good evening. Good to see you. Welcome as always. Truth will set you free. Says, hey, one John. Hey, uh, truth will set you free. Good to see you as well. As uh, she says, hey, everyone. Hope everything is awesome over there. Uh, seek the Lord says, shalom, everyone. Shalom, seek the Lord. And Psalm 94 says, hello. Greetings, Christopher and Onia. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Kalamentos also says, shalom, everyone. All right. Great to see everyone on tonight. Um, so far, let me see. We got LXR, shalom from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada once again. Great to see you. And it says, good to be back. Good to have you back as always. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I know we got a few people over there on TikTok as well. We have uh, Maji Call. Maji Call sent me a whip, whipped coffee and, don't, and a donut. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, we have a few more people joining us over there on TikTok. Um, Teresa says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Teresa. If you guys, if there's anyone uh, that has... Um, put comments in before I started. Sometimes I can't see those comments, so my apologies in advance. So tonight we are going to be talking about, uh, okay, so tonight we are going to be talking about biblical chronology. Uh, so far, uh, Onia, I just got a message from Onia, actually. He said I'll be on shortly. Uh, yeah, he's not, he's not in the waiting room yet, so... Uh, yeah, looking forward to that. So we got uh, different books that give us different dates. Uh, like I got some hardcover or hard copy books, I should say, hardcover, hard copy books of some of the some of the material we're going to be talking about tonight. This is the Septuagint, uh, the uh, Septuagint with the Apocrypha, the Brenton Septuagint. Um, and also, I have a uh, copy of the Israel. Israelite Samaritan version of the Torah. Okay, this is a very, very interesting book because for those of you who don't know, there are um, uh, the Samaritan version of the Torah or the, the Samaritan Pentateuch, however you want to call it. Uh, are uh, it's a different family of manuscripts. It is um, uh, it's a very ancient. It comes from a very ancient Hebrew text, and so the author of this book translated. Uh, the Hebrew text, uh, Benjamin Sadaka translated the Hebrew text into English and compared the Samaritan text with the, uh, I guess you would say, the conventional Masoretic text. And uh, every every spot that ha that's different, every might, like every every uh, difference between the texts uh, he has in bold. And uh, yeah, he points out all the differences. So this is a very, very interesting um, very, very interesting book. Uh, I just noticed here, Truth Will Set You Free says, I have been loving comparing the Samaritan with the Masoretic text. Yes, uh, Truth Will Set You Free, actually, I believe uh, she has a copy of this book as well. And we are going to be talking about the Book of Jubilees also, Lord willing, about, you know, the Book of Jubilees has got a lot of different dates in there. And so uh, Book of Jubilees is about Jubilees, right? It's about the different dates. Um, so we're, we're going to be talking about all that stuff, uh, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, let's see what we got here. We got Tahish, Tahisha, excuse me, Tahisha says, Shalom, Shalom, Tahisha. Great to see you. And we got Onia here in the comments. I'll be on soon. My computer is slow. You know what? I was almost panicking myself. I mean, I came on here. I thought I'd be early. I thought I'd be early. I came, I, I came on here, and I was almost ready to go like, 
10 minutes beforehand. Okay. And uh, I turn on, it's like all of a sudden the, the computer just froze. And, and then it, you know, I thought, well, let me, you know, I thought, I thought I'll let, I'll let it uh, see if it can resolve the issue itself. And it did after three or four minutes and then it froze again. And, uh, and it, it happened like that right up until seven o'clock. Finally, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it anyway and see how it goes. So yeah, we have some technical difficulties. So, uh, let's just pray that, uh, Onia's computer there is going to be behaving as my computer was misbehaving just a few minutes ago. All right. So yeah. Um, for those of you who, uh, who are not familiar with some of these texts, uh, we have um, this, the Septuagint, which is one of the oldest of the three. I mean, this, the Masoretic is more of the younger uh, family of manuscripts. Um, it wasn't really finalized. I mean, it took a number of years, you know, to, to make and to actually to put together. Uh, and it wasn't really fa finalized until approximately a thousand AD or 900 AD, something like that. Uh, whereas uh, the Septuagint is much older than that, uh, pretty much a thousand years older than that, give or take. And so uh, a lot of times when you're reading the, the, New, the New Testament, um, you will see references to the so-called Old Testament. I hate to call it Old Testament because it's like the Tanakh, okay? Um, you see references to the Tanakh. And I don't know how many of you have actually kind of cross-referenced or just looked, you know, looked up those references, looked up those quotes. And a lot of times it's it's different. And so a lot of times when it's different, you know what you should do? You should pull out this, the um, Septuagint because the Septuagint in many places is more in line, or I should say the New Testament in many places is more in line with the uh, with the Septuagint than it is the Masoretic. Although there are sometimes it's the Masoretic is a little bit more uh, in, in in some instances. Okay, so one John two twenty six says, "When in doubt, reboot." Yeah, yeah, I was going to do that. You know what? I'm I had so much problems even just earlier today. Even the internet. It's like I I looked at the uh, connection. It said no internet connection. I'm like, what? No internet connection. It's got to be. So I had to unplug the connection and plug it back in. Uh, I tend to like to keep it plugged in as opposed to Wi-Fi just to, just for um, uh, just to be a little bit more secure. And so I had to do that and I finally got it back. And by the way, yeah, you know what? The computer today rebooted. It must have rebooted like three or four times. I don't know what what was up with it, but it just kept on rebooting. And uh, I don't think it was updates either. So Hopefully things go well tonight, and um, if if for any reason I do disappear, hang in there. I will be back, but hope, hopefully everything is good, all right? Um, the Tower Times says, howdy and shalom, brothers and sisters, bless y'all. Howdy, the Tower Time, and blessings multiplied back to you, brother. Great to see you. Uh, LXR says, I thought there was only the Bible. I didn't know there was the Torah and the other ones. This is very interesting. Yes, yes. Um, Jordan, speaking of Jordan, um, great to see you, by the way, Jordan. Uh, if we have time uh, while we're waiting for Onia, I'll show you a few. I'll show you guys a few a few differences in the Septuagint. And one of these differences, actually, Jordan brought to my attention, and so. Uh, um, we will, uh, I will show you those, uh, those few differences while I'm waiting for Onia. Psalm 94 says, I've had internet connection trouble over the last two days. Crazy. All right. It's technology, folks. It's technology. Um, so Onia says, I have my phone if I can't get this running. Okay. All right. In the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to pull up the Septuagint and let's, um, you know what? Let let me show you one of the let me show you one of the biggest. I guess you would say biggest. Um, uh, just a second here. Let me show you one of the things that, uh, and I know you guys have seen this before. Some of you guys have seen this before. Um,
I'm going to go over to, for, for those of you like uh, LXR that, do, that don't, uh, that's not very familiar with this stuff. And let me just show you this, this stuff before, um, in the meantime here. Uh, just give me a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to compare it with the uh, the psalm that it's quoting in Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to compare it with the Masoretic and the Septuagint. And also, if we have time, I want to show you guys the... Uh, I'm going to show you guys the passage that Jordan pointed out to me uh, s several days ago. Uh, just to give me a second here. Okay, so... Um, okay. All right, so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Here we are. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. It says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, quote, Okay, this is quoting Psalm 40, verse 6, by the way. Quote, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And there you go right there. There is the reference Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Okay, so pay attention very carefully here. Very, very, very carefully. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Especially that, that one line right there. But a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said... Behold, I've come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Okay. Okay. So let's go over to the King James Version. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is this is the New King James Version. But let's go over to the typical text here in Psalm 40. It says, Sacrifice and offering you didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. My ears, my ears hast thou opened. Well, what is that all about? Mine ears has thou opened. Um, it says over here, it's supposed to say uh, a body you've prepared for me, but mine ears has thou opened. Now, if you go over to, uh, you might say here, you're comparing the New King James to the King James. Let's just go over to the, well, compare apples to apples. Um, so it says here, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. My ears you have open. What's what's up with that? Well, this is from the Masoretic text. Okay. The uh in the New Testament, it's quoting apparently some other text. But if you go to the uh the Septuagint, this is the Brenton Septuagint, Psalm 40. In some Bibles, it is Psalm 39, verse 6: sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast thou prepared me. So there is uh proof here that uh, the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Septuagint, or at least the same text that, that, is, that, the, uh, that, excuse me, that the Septuagint is sourced from, as opposed to the typical Masoretic text. So there's just a good example right there. All right, so um, let's see, we have Onia here. How's uh, how things looking over there, Onia? I can't hear you, but are you ready to go? I'm not sure if he's ready yet. Um, okay, let's just... Uh, Jordan, are you still there, Jordan? Remember that, uh, that, um, that passage that you that you brought to my attention. I believe it was Amos chapter three, if I can remember correctly. I can't, I'm not sure the exact verse. Amos chapter three. Okay, all right. All right, so. Um, okay. Okay. 
Amos chapter six, verse three. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, all right. Just give me a minute there, Onia. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, Amos chapter six, verse three, and we'll we'll, we'll uh, compare uh, the Samar no, excuse me, the Masoretic with the Septuagint. Amos chapter six, verse three. Okay, so the New King James, which I would as assume that it's very close to the King James, says, "Woe to you." who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out, uh, your, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. Okay, so especially this verse right here. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seed of violence to come near. Now the Septuagint says this, you, ye who are approaching the evil day, who are drawing near and adopting false Sabbaths. Very, very different. Very, very different. And so that's very interesting. Okay, so let's, uh, let's bring Onia on here and we'll see... Hopefully everything goes well. Everyone give Onia a very warm welcome, please. How's it going there, Onia? It's going good. Thank you for having me on again. Oh, you're Can welcome. You... Uh, just a second here. I think my audio, you might hear some echo. Do you hear any echo over there? Uh, no echo. Okay. Unfortunately, it says that because I joined... After it started, I can't peer uh, your stream to my channel, so I'll just have to I'll just have to download it after this is over, and then re up re upload it to mine after. Okay, no problem. All right, so um, welcome, welcome. What do you what do you have on the schedule there, Onia? Do you want to just uh, what do you um, what do you what do you have planned? Well, um, before we get into that, I'll just say uh, I'm not quite sure about the Psalm one that you mentioned, but uh, the Amos one in particular, that actually is due to the Hebrew text reads basically, uh, essentially it reads the same. It's just being interpreted differently. So the word for seat is spelled the same as the word for Sabbath in that verse. So... It's the difference of uh, interpretation. So that's why the uh, Septuagint translators, they interpreted that Hebrew word as referring to Sabbath. And then the Masoretic scribes, they interpreted it as referring to a seat. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's the uh, context is what's important to... Uh, determine what uh, the original reading is because even though you know for example the sabbath one might sound uh might be one that we'd be inclined to uh agree with it, it could uh be it could mean seat like like how masoretic renders it and uh i think if you look I don't know if it's a few verses before or a few verses after, but I think it mentions something about a seat or something like, or sitting in surrounding verses. So I think that's why they, the Masoretic, um, they add vowel markings to, to indicate what they think the word is. And so they added vowel markings to indicate that they thought the word was seat. And uh, it's probably just because of the surrounding verses that they thought we're supporting that particular reading. Um, but there's a, tons of differences like that, and it all comes down to uh, interpretation much of the time. Sometimes there's different Hebrew words that are the source of the difference, but much of the time it's the same Hebrew word just being interpreted uh, very differently. And uh, the word for Sabbath... Um, 
No, so like when you're trying to determine root words for Hebrew, uh, it's not always clear what the root meaning is. However, the word for seat and the word for Sabbath, if they do come from the same root, you could see how they could be related. So for example, uh, to, to rest, right? Or to lie down. To, to rest, so that's for Sabbath. And a seat is something you rest on uh, or you lie down on. So you can see how potentially those two words could be uh, related in meaning, one meaning to cease or to rest, and then another meaning something you rest on. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, so for the Psalm one, I had to do more study on that one. Uh, it probably has something to do, just like like we said, with uh, interpretation difference. Um, but I, uh, I don't have any answer for that particular variant at the moment. But uh, yeah, so we'll get started uh, with, with the focus of the study today. Uh, so I didn't do as much preparation this time because a lot of it's uh in my head and and also uh there's on wikipedia it actually has a really great uh summary of the differences in genesis for the different manuscript traditions so i'm going to be reading from the wikipedia article the, the different uh number variants is that something that you would like me to pull up oh uh, yeah sure that, that'd be good uh, so you could pull up uh the genealogies of genesis wikipedia article and there's going to be a section let's see Which, which part is it? Oh, yeah, it's the uh, Genesis Chrono Genealogy. Okay. Um, just trying to get this the right size so it doesn't... Mm, yeah. It's still going to be small for a lot of people, especially on... Um... There's no way to that it can cover the whole thing, or...? um this is what i got so far like this oh okay i mean that looks that looks big to me i don't know if how it looks for other people yeah i, I think on a mobile device that might be a little bit small but i'm not sure how to without mm. blow, like, oh know, that's without true getting, yeah um all right so yeah only i'll just let you um yeah so if you want you can uh scroll down to the chart there's a there's actually a chart below okay so that chart i'm going to have to yeah. oh yeah that's the problem so it's, it's not really ideal oh. um let me see if i can just so may, maybe what i'll do is uh hold on uh if you want you can uh you could stop sharing your screen I, I could try to share my screen all right let's see if that works um Melody says it doesn't look too bad on, on her phone, and so does uh, LXR. They say it's it form formats okay on their phones. Okay. But uh, yeah, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let's see. Is it is it showing? Yeah. It just popped up. I'm gonna have it's to put it up. It's showing the chart. Now you can't, you can't put that up. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, is it showing the chart or no? I've got the chart up here, but I'm just wondering if you can put it up or is it, I guess I would. That's what I'm I mean. Is it, is it, is it showing, uh, or is it show yeah. what's, what screen am I showing? Right there. Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> so let me, let me stop. Yeah. I can, um, let me see the one I got here. Um, 
Yeah, that, that works. That's fine. Okay. All right. So, um, so the actual text of Genesis, so there's two, there's two chapters in Genesis where these variants are occurring. And so they're Genesis chapter five and Genesis chapter 11. And the way the variants here work is it, in the genealogy, it says so and so took as a um, right, that's Jubilees. Okay, so and so had uh, their first son at a certain number of years of age. So, as an example, the first the first man was Adam, and it says in Genesis that when he was 130 years old, he had his first not his first, but he had a son named Seth. So Seth was born 130 year when Adam was 130 years old. Then what Genesis says is that Adam lived an additional 800 years. And then the total number of years, it also gives us in the text of Genesis. It says the total number of years he lived was 930 years. The Samaritan agrees. It says the same thing for Adam. So he was 130 years old, and he lived 800 years after, and then he died when he was 930 years old. The Septuagint very peculiar, peculiarly says that Adam was 230 years old when he had his son Seth. And then after that, he lived 700 years, and he the total number of years he lived was 930 years. So all three versions agree with the 930 years. Adam was 930 years old when he died. All three are witnesses to that. But the Masoretic and Samaritan both agree with the 130 and 800. 130 plus 800 is 930. But the Septuagint has 230 and 700 uh, to combine to 930. So the strange thing here is that the Septuagint adds 100 or has an extra 100 for Adam, how old he was when he had Seth, and then it subtracts 100 for the remainder, remaining number of years. What this tells us is that this difference is not an accident. This means the scribes intentionally change the numbers. Either the Septuagint scribes intentionally added 100 for how old the, the person was when they had their son, and they subtracted 100 from the number of remaining years so that the, so that the final total number of years would be the same. Either that or the Masoretic and Samaritan subtracted 100 from how old the person was and then added an extra 100 years to bring the same total number of years. That's what we see for almost every single one of these. We see the difference between 100 for how old they are, and then the difference is subtracted or added to the remaining years to bring about the same ending number of years of how old they are when they died. So because it's very consistent like that, that means it wasn't an accident and the scribe intentionally changed it, the reason being they believed that there was a certain chronology or, or time frame that it needed to, to fit. Now, I'm of the view that the Septuagint is the one that uh, altered things um, for much of this. Uh, and the reason being is that other historical records from different nations have the earth being older or there being records, uh, history of civilization going back farther. If you look at secular history for the Egyptians and the Chinese, it actually goes back, and the Sumerians, it goes back, according to the scholars, uh, farther than the Masoretic and Samaritan. So scribes wanting the text of the Bible to be accurate, they, I believe they changed it to make it agree with the other historical records in other nations. The, the opposite is not likely. 
that they shortened the, the time frame because if they shortened the time frame, they would have been creating a chrono chronology error co or issue compared with the other uh, nations. In other words, they didn't have a motive to make it harder for people to regard these records as historically reliable. Uh, it's more likely that these shorter readings are more original and that the scribes were uncomfortable with this apparent contradiction with other historical records outside of the Bible. And so they added an extra hundred years for how old they are to significantly prolong, uh, extend how many years back Adam was uh, born or Adam was created in the beginning. So to give you an idea here, uh, well, let me read a few more and then I, I will uh, show how the Septuagint adding 100 extra each time significantly uh, extends the time frame. So, okay, so next we have Seth. And so it says when Seth was 105 years old in the Masoretic and Samaritan, he was 105, he had Enosh as a son. And then 807 years after, he lived for a total of 912. The uh, Septuagint, again, it says instead of 105, it says 205. And then subtracts 100 from the remaining years. So 707 years remaining. The total is 912. Next, you have Enosh. He was 90 years old, according to Masoretic and Samaritan. And, so, and much of the time, we have two witnesses against one. So Masoretic and Samaritan, two witnesses for Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, and Mahalel all agree with Masoretic and Samaritan against the Septuagint. Uh, and so Enosh was 90 years old. In Masoretic and Samaritan, when he had Kenan, and then 815 years later, he lived the remaining years of his life, so the total of 905. Septuagint, same total, but 190 years instead of 90, and subtracting 100 uh, from the remaining years is 715. And next you have Kenan, and he was 70 years old when he had Mahalel. 840 years later it was the remaining years for a total of 910. That's the reading of the Masoretic and Samaritan. The Septuagint has 170 years when uh, he had Mahalalel, and then 740 years later, so 100 less for the remaining years, the same total, 910. And then we have Mahalalel, and that is 65 years when they, he had his son, Jared, and then lived the remainder of his life, 830 years for the total of 895. Both Masoretic and Samaritan agree with that. Septuagint, 165 years uh, when he had his son, Jared, and then the remainder of 730 years, 100 less than Masoretic and Samaritan for the total, same total, 895. But now things start to get different. Okay, so now we have Jared. For Jared, the Masoretic agrees with the Septuagint. And so the Masoretic says, when Jared was 162 years old, he had Enoch. And then 800 years later, uh, he lived for a total of 962 years. The same total for the Septuagint. However, the Samaritan says he was not 162, he was 62 years old. And then 785 years later, wait a minute, it's not 100 less this time, or, you know, it's not 100 more this time. Instead, it's, it's 100 less for the son, when, how old he was when he had a son. And it's 15 less for the remaining years. So the final remaining years is 847 in, instead of 962. So if Masoretic and Septuagint would we believe their record, 
Jared lived 962 years. He lived older than Adam, according to Masoretic and Septuagint. But the Samaritan witness says he lived 847 years, which is shorter than Adam. And in fact, shorter than all the other uh, ancestors so far. Next, we have, so if Masoretic and Septuagint is to believe, Jared was the second oldest. If uh, Samaritan is to believe, Jared is one of the younger, youngest ones of the ancestors. So now we've got Enoch. Enoch was 65 years old and uh, when he had his son Methuselah. And then 300 years later, he uh, lived for the total number of years he lived before he was translated, not before he died, but before he was translated, Genesis says, 365 years. All three are grouped 365 years. Septuagint, however, has 165 for how old he was when he had Methuselah and subtracts 100 for the remaining years, 200. Next is, if you want, you can uh, scroll down the chart a little. Yeah. Um, so, uh, not that much. Like, let's see, um, basically, uh, make, make Noah near the bottom, like a little lower for Noah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's good. All right. So Methuselah, now things start getting quite different. Methuselah in the Masoretic says 187. Again, it's an extra 100. And the total is 969. You know, so Methuselah was the oldest, 969, according to Masoretic and Septuagint. Septuagint agrees with the, with the oldest uh, age, 969. However, the Septuagint, instead of 187, it has 167. He was 167 when he had Lamech. And then remainder years, 802. Methuselah, uh, Masoretic, uh, the remaining years, 782. Again, both add up to 969. But now here's something really interesting. The Samaritan has 67 with uh, when he, was, when he uh, had Lamech. Now take a look. All the earlier examples, you have the smaller number is exactly 100 less, right? For uh, than the Septuagint, from all of them, for uh, for if you look at the Samaritan, so Adam, 130 in the Samaritan, versus 230 in the Septuagint, Seth, 105 versus 205, Enosh, 90 versus 190, Kenan, 70 versus 170, Mahalel, 65 versus 165, Jared, 62 versus 162, Enoch, 65 versus 165, but now look. Masoretic is 187. Samaritan is 67, not 87. So Samaritan is 67. Septuagint is 167. So it appears that the 67 is the original reading. I, it's either 67 or 167. Masoretic 187 is not correct because the, remember, the, like I said, Samaritan consistently is 100 less and Septuagint, 100 more. So the Samaritan is 100 less than the Septuagint reading. So that shows that the 67 rather than the 87 part is the correct reading there because of the two witnesses. Septuagint agrees with that 67 reading. Lamech, uh, oh yeah, and the total for Methuselah, by the way, in the Samaritan, 720 years old. So in Masoretic and Septuagint, he's 969 years old when he dies, the oldest man ever. But Samaritan, he's only 720 years old when he dies. That's the youngest of all these people besides Enoch. And then Lamech, 182. Okay, 182 is how old he was when he had Noah. And then 595 remaining years for a total of 777 years in the Masoretic. 
Then we have the Septuagint, 188 years. Again, it's different than 182. 188. Then 565 remaining years. So notice Masoretic has 595 remaining and the Septuagint has 565 remaining. The total number is 753 for how old he was when he died. Now look at the Masoretic, uh, excuse me, Samaritan reading. He was 53 years old when he had Noah. 600 years later remaining for a total of 653. Interestingly enough, the total age when Lamech died, 653, is 100 less than the Septuagint, 753. Uh, so the 653 reading, even it's a hundred less than the Septuagint, but it's, that shows that the final age, the total age of Lamech was most likely 653 or 753 and not 777. The fact that the Samaritan and Septuagint both agree with 53 at the end suggests that, uh, that's the original reading for that final numbers. Uh, but so you can see, this is very uh, different. So why are the later ones so different? And the reason is because of when, when the flood occurred. So the Samaritan has Jared, it has Methuselah and Lamech all dying in the, in the year of the flood. If you look at the final column, it shows the the year from creation when they died. So in the Samaritan column, that's the middle column, it shows Jared died in the year 1307. Methuselah died in the year 1307. And Lamech died in the year 1307. So all three dying in that uh, same year. But the other versions... Masoretic and Septuagint have them dying uh, very far apart from each other. The, the Masoretic has Methuselah and Lamech dying close to the same year. Methuselah, 1656, the year of the flood, and Lamech, 1651. The Septuagint has 50-year difference between Lamech and Methuselah's death. Uh, but yeah, so now, you know how uh, I said 100 years uh, extra can significantly prolong or extend the timeline? How, when, when was Adam created? How long ago? According to the Masoretic, it was around 4,000 uh, 4, BC when Adam was created. But according to Septuagint, it was even earlier than that because... Watch this. So if you look in the final columns, it gives you the uh, the year, right? So in the, in, the, in the first column, it gives you the year they were born. So the way it works is in, in the Masoretic, you got Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. That means Seth was born 130 years after creation. Then Seth was 105 years old when he had Enosh. That means... Enosh was born 235 years after creation because 130 plus 105 is 235. And then Enosh was 90 years old when he had Kenan. Therefore, Kenan was born in the year 325 after creation because 235 plus 90 is 325. So you see, that's how uh, the birth, how old they were when they had their, their son enables you to have the chronology for what year it was from creation when that person was born and thus what year the flood occurred because the flood occurs in the 500th year of Noah's life. But when you go to the Septuagint, Adam was born 230 years after creation. And then, and then Seth was born, uh, excuse me. And then Seth had his son Enosh, uh, 205 when he was 205 years old. So 230 plus uh, 205 is 435, not 235. So already by the time Enosh is born, the Septuagint has added 200 extra years back in time. Then you go to Kenan, 90 years, Septuagint adds another 190. So now you have 625 compared to 325. 
now the Septuagint has an extra 300 years back in time. If you keep going like that, uh, Mahalalel 395 versus 795 when, when he was born after creation. Then Jared, 960 years after creation in the Septuagint, only 460 years after creation in the Masoretic and, and the, the uh, Samaritan. Then you go to Enoch. In the Samaritan, 522, uh, he was 522 years old when he was born. In the Masoretic, he was 622. In the Septuagint, 1122. So compared to the Samaritan, the Septuagint has an extra 600 years of history that it's pushed it back. Next, Methuselah, Samaritan has it at 587 years after creation when Methuselah was born, and the Masoretic has 687 years after. Septuagint, 1,287 years after. And then uh, Lamech, 654 years after creation uh, versus versus 874 in the Masoretic versus 1,454 in the Septuagint. Then you go down to Noah. So uh, you could scroll down for the screen. And then, um, so Noah, 1,056 years after creation, he was born in the Masoretic, 707 years old after uh, creation in the Samaritan, 1,642 years after creation in the Septuagint. And then uh, Shem was born two years after the flood, according to Genesis. So Shem was born 1,558. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Shem was 100 years, almost 100 years old, uh, minus two, uh, when the flood occurred. So you've got... Uh, 1558 years old when Shem, uh, I mean, years after creation when Shem was born in the Masoretic. But the Septuagint, 1209, 350 years less than the Masoretic. And then the Septuagint, 2144, 2144 years after creation when Shem was born. And then when the flood occurred, 1650 so you can scroll down a little more so 1656 because like i said it's two years before he was 100 before shem was 100 so when shem was 98 the flood occurred which means so our facts had um so it was uh 656 years after creation for when a flood occurred in the Masoretic. 1307 years after creation in the Samaritan. 2244 uh, 42 years after creation when the flood occurred in the Septuagint. So to recap here, if the Samaritan reading is correct, that means the Septuagint has added an extra 950 years back into history. So that means Adam was uh, born 950 years earlier than the Samaritan says so far. That's almost a thousand years lost. If the Septuagint is correct, a thousand years are lost in the Samaritan. Um, now, th there's more to go on. For, for chapter 11 of Genesis, but we're going to stop here for a second. And so this is going to throw a wrench into things, a few apocrypha things. First of all, the book of Jubilees does the chronology a little bit different. It does it based on, uh, instead of how old they were when they were born, it tells us the, jub the, the jubilee that it was, the year week it was, and the year it was. So a year week means... Uh, Every seven years is considered a group, it, like a single week of years. And there's seven weeks of years in a jubilee, according to scripture. So seven years is one week of years. 
the next seven is the second week of years for a total of seven weeks of years, which is 49 years in a Jubilee. So Jub Book of Jubilees goes with the uh, a Jubilee cycle being 49 years, not 50 years. There's an interpretation by many people that a Jubilee is 50 years. Uh, this is based on the, the Bible in the Old Testament in the Law of Moses, such as uh, Leviticus or Deuteronomy, which gives the laws for the Jubilee, how to, how to calculate the Jubilee. And it says 49 years, and in the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. So there's two interpretations. It's 49 years, the 50th year, and then the year after starts the next Jubilee, that's one view. So that means it's 50 years. Or the other view is there's 49 years, and then the 50th year is the also the first year of the next Jubilee. And that is the position of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Jubilees and the Temple Scroll. That, that's the position of uh, also of certain uh, documents in the uh, Bible as well, like the Book of Daniel. But uh, did you want to say something, Christopher? I noticed the screen disappeared, so I, I thought maybe you uh, were wanting to. Now, just um, are you done with the chart? Um, I'm, I'm going to be going back to the chart uh, in a, a bit, but if you want, uh, did you want to read some of the stuff here? Or? No, no, that's fine. I'll just put you up on. Uh, do you want me to put the chart back up, or you want to like full um, screen? Yeah, put the chart back up again. Um, All right. Because okay. there's a second part to it uh, yeah. for the chart. Okay. Um, so Jubilees is very interesting because, so Jubilees, like I said, it goes with a 49 year, uh, calculation for how long a Jubilee is. And the, uh, the, the dates that Jubilees gives for these figures from Adam all the way to Shem and the flood is it goes with the Samaritan. Jubilees agrees with all the Samaritan dates, without exception. So a lot of people, a lot of scholars in older uh, decades, believe that the Samaritan version of Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Samaritan Torah, it's called, because the Samaritan Bible had only the five books, the Pentateuch. So the Samaritans have very many different readings. So some scholars initially... You, like a century ago or two centuries ago, they believe that the Samaritan readings often were created by the Samaritans and that therefore they were not reliable. However, more research has been done in the Samaritan readings. And what we've seen is that the Samaritan readings, virtually all of them were not created by the Samaritans. They simply uh, came from earlier Jewish copy that the Samaritans received. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls, which has no affiliation with the Samaritans whatsoever. The Dead Sea Scroll group would have condemned the Samaritans as a false group. But they have many of the same Samaritan readings in their copies of the Torah, of Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, and in the Septuagint shares a lot of variants from the Samaritan against the Masoretic, beyond coincidence. It shows that the Septuagint and Samaritan are a very often a sibling uh, relationship uh, in their readings. And so uh, Septuagint also did not have a Samaritan affiliation. Even more so, the Book of Jubilees had no reason to say, oh yeah, we're, you know what, we're going to go and agree with the, the Samaritan copies because, you know, the Samaritans, even though they're heretics, we're going to change our, our scripture or our document to agree with the Samaritan heretics. That doesn't make sense. So what that means is Jubilees went with a Genesis text. Where, so some people don't believe Jubilees is authentic. So whether it's authentic or not, it corresponds with the Genesis text that agrees with the Samaritan, these dates. Uh, so that shows that the Samaritan readings are very ancient. Uh, now, some things in support of the Samaritan, the, it's the like I said, it's very short. So um, the the secular records make it look like the Samaritan is unreliable and 
and inaccurate historically. That actually is a point in its favor because that shows that it's more likely that the Samaritans did not, uh, uh, that, that the scribes didn't reduce it because they wouldn't have seen the records of other nations going back thousands of years and saying, you know what? I don't want our records to go that far back. I'm going to shorten it to make it look like we're a much younger nation. That's actually the opposite of what tended to happen in ancient times. In ancient times, there was a whole debate about who was the oldest, who had the earliest literature, who was the most original uh, history and faith and religion. The Christians in the early centuries, like Justin Martyr, they argued this and they, and they appealed to the Septuagint as proof that uh, the Greeks and the, and the pagans got their information from the Bible uh, because of how much older the Bible was. So there was this whole polemic in ancient times, this whole agenda of the, trying to decide whose texts were earlier. Uh, so that's one thing. But then another thing is the Book of Enoch. Now, Christopher Enoch is going through the Book of Enoch right now. In the Book of Enoch, there, there are uh, some things in it that don't agree with the Septuagint. Now, some people are inclined to the Septuagint reading. But the problem with that is it, it doesn't match for certain things. For example, in Enoch chapter, it's in the, the first section of Enoch. I forget which exact chapter. But Enoch is being shown the trees in the garden. And it says that this tree is the one that aged Adam ate from. So, uh, le so le let, me, uh, let me go to that. Um, okay, no, aged mother. But... Uh, did, did you want to pull up that verse, Christopher Enoch? This is from Book of Enoch, and that is uh, chapter 32, and, yeah, the chapter 32 of Enoch. Okay. They're short chapters, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, wait, this is this, uh, okay. It looked like it was a different order for a second. All chapter right. Chapter 32. Yeah, so what we've got here is, He's being shown the Garden of Eden. So you go to verse 3. And I came to the Garden of Righteousness and saw beyond those trees many large trees growing there. And it says, and the tree of wisdom, whereof they eat and know great wisdom. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 4, that tree is in height like the fir, and its leaves are like those of the carob tree, and its fruit is is like the clusters of the vine, very beautiful, and the fragrance of the tree penetrates afar. Verse 5, Then I said, How beautiful is the tree, and how attractive is its look. Verse 6, Then Raphael, the holy angel, who was with me, answered me and said, This is the tree of wisdom, of which thy father, old in years, and thy aged mother, who were before thee, have eaten. And they learnt wisdom, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven out of the garden. According to this verse, they're still alive at this time. They're saying, they're, thy father, old in years. So he, your father, Adam, is old in years, and thy mother is aged. They, that was the tree that they ate from. This, this is when Enoch is still alive. Now, if you go, can you go back to the chart? Okay, so if you scroll up, and uh, remember I said that according to how it... it like each age, like Adam when he had Seth 130 years, and then Seth when he was 105 had Enosh. So you add those two together, 130 plus 105, that's 235 years after creation, right? Mm -hmm. But the Septuagint, it, it, it's 200, or it's an extra 100, and that makes it an extra 100 every time there's a new generation. So now watch. Adam was 930 years old when he died. That means... He died 930 years after creation. When was Enoch born? The Septuagint, 1122 years after creation when Enoch was born. That means, according to the Septuagint, Adam died before Enoch was even born. But if you go to the Masoretic and Samaritan, 
Adam is still alive when Enoch is born, which means that the Septuagint cannot be correct in, in these extra 100 years if the book of Enoch is correct in this verse, because this verse says that they're still alive when Enoch is alive. That's an important reading right there. Then we have, uh, in the very end of the book of Enoch, Noah is born. And um, Enoch ha was not translated yet when, when uh, Noah was born. So if you look, when was Noah born? In the Masoretic text, 1,056 years. Enoch had already been translated. If you go to when he was translated, Masoretic, it says 987 years after creation, Enoch was translated. Noah was born 1,056 years after creation, according to the Masoretic. Um, can you scroll down a little bit? Because my uh, our faces are blocking it. Okay. Um, so Septuagint has Noah being born 1,642 years after creation, whereas uh, Enoch, uh, according to Septuagint, he's translated 1,487. So again, it doesn't match. Noah has already uh, Enoch has already been gone when uh, Noah is born, but go to Samaritan, you have Enoch, he is translated 887 years after creation. When was Noah born? 707 uh, years after creation. So according to the book of Enoch, Enoch was still here when Noah was born. That can only agree with the Samaritan reading. So right there, we have two, two things from Enoch in his favor. Um, and then, let's see... Then we have, let's see, there, there is a, also a statement of when, how old Enoch was when he had his dreams, I believe, if I remember correctly. Let's see, uh, let me just double check here. Um, Um, okay, I might be wrong on this one where I don't think it gives, I actually don't think it gives a year here. Um, hold on one second. I'm just looking for the keyword year to see if it says how old he was in any place. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't see what I was thinking was there, but yeah, but yeah. So uh, those are the uh, those are the main things against the Septuagint, actually, uh, from the Book of Enoch. Those, those are two like the two things I mentioned: uh, Noah's birth, as well as uh, his, Adam and Eve actually still being alive when Enoch was already born. Those don't uh, agree with the Septuagint, um, and so. Uh, and Jubilees, like I said, it agrees with the Samaritan dates for, without exception, for from Adam all the way to uh, Shem and the flood occurring. Uh, the difference in Jubilees is it doesn't tell you how many years after they lived. But since it agrees exactly with the Samaritan numbers, we can trust the Samaritan numbers for the remainder of the years. Um but now that's that is the uh, chapter five. Now some people might say, "Well, Jubilees just copied what the Samaritan says." The problem with that is in chapter eleven, the Jubilees disagrees with all three completely. There's no 
Jubilees has no similarity whatsoever to any of the dates in the Samaritan, Masoretic, or Septuagint for chapter 11. So it would be odd for the, the writer of Jubilees to say, you know what, I'm going to copy all the Samaritan dates for chapter 5 from chapter 5. But chapter 11, now nah, I'm just going to do random stuff there. It, that's not as plausible. So I submit Jubilees as an additional witness to uh, the dates for uh, chapter 11. So now let's let's start going through uh, those ones. So if you scroll down to the people after. Now, interestingly enough, look, look, let's look at the people here. We've got Shem had a son named Arphaxad. Now, only the Septuagint has someone named Canaan. But after that comes Selah, then Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nehor, Terah, and Abram. Okay, so that is what comes in chapter 11. Now, um, but like Masoretic and Samaritan do not have Canaan. Septuagint does. And guess what? The Book of Jubilees also has Canaan, interestingly enough. So again, if they were copying from the Samaritan, why are they going with the Septuagint and adding uh, Canaan? Um, and then the Gospel of Luke also has Canaan in the, the genealogy of the Messiah when it goes back all the way to Adam. Canaan, who's not in Masoretic, not in Septuagint, uh, excuse me, not in Samaritan, not in Masoretic. Canaan is in the uh, Septuagint, and he is in the Book of Jubilees. Now, this is a different Canaan from Ham's Canaan. That's why there might be some confusion among uh, scribes when they saw that. They might have confused the two. And then, okay, so now if you, if you go back up to where it says Shem. All right, so... So, um, no, you can actually just go to our facts ad for the uh, first, uh, yeah, because that because that allows us to see the whole chart. So, so when our facts ad, according to the map, basically, what's really interesting here is the. Uh, it's it's very odd. So, the sip. Tuagen and Samaritan agree in the birth, the number of years or how old they were uh, when they were born. Almost all of them. The Masoretic is a hundred less in this case. So remember in the in uh, chapter five, Samaritan consistently was a hundred less. Now it's the Masoretic which is consistently a hundred less, pretty much all the time. And the Samaritan and the Septuagint are an extra 100. So, um, very strange how the one chapter has extra 100 in Samaritan, but in the chapter 5 it doesn't, whereas Septuagint has the extra 100 in both. Whereas the Masoretic has, uh, doesn't have the extra 100 in most of chapter 5 and in all of chapter 11. So it's a very like confusing uh, situation here. So now we look and we see our fact said was 35 years old, according to the Masoretic. 403 years later, remaining for a total of 438 years. Now, interestingly, the Masoretic and Samaritan have the same total number of years. So we've got 438 total, 433 total. Uh, they differ with Eber, but Peleg total number of years, 239. Reu, also 239. Serug, total is 230. Nehor, total is 148. Uh, Terra, it differs, but Abram's the same between the three. Okay? So they are consistent in that way. However, the Septuagint, strangely, um, has very different very different uh, final remaining dates. Instead of subtracting 100 for the remaining years, it doesn't subtract 100 for the remaining years. Um, it, it, it does, uh, it, it keeps the same remaining years for most of these. 
um, and then and it also some it sometimes changes it slightly. So, uh, but for example, Peleg, Masoretic is two two oh nine. Samaritan subtracts 100, 109, but Septuagint keeps the 209 that the Masoretic has. Rayu has the 207 because it's 32 plus 207. Septuag uh, Samaritan, 132 plus 107, 239. But Septuagint, 132 and 207 with the Masoretic instead of 107 for a total of 339. Uh, and then Serug, 30 and 200 Masoretic, total of 230. The uh, Samaritan, 130 and then 100 less, 100 for a total of 230. But the Septuagint, 130, so an extra 100. And then it keeps the remaining years from Masoretic, 200 for a total of 330. Um, so you can see this very strange stuff here. Uh, it's inconsistent. So the principle of adding 100 and subtracting 100 uh, in, in corresponding measure um, is kept with the Samaritan, between the Samaritan and the Masoretic. So the Septuagint is the one that's out of line here, where they're not changing the remaining years like they're supposed to in, in that pattern that was established in chapter 5 and chapter 11. They're keeping the wrong remaining years. So that shows the Septuagint seems to be secondary in this section. Um, so really the main win the main versions to consider in my view would be the, the Masoretic and Samaritan readings for this chapter. Uh, with the exception of the extra the extra line Canaan because Jubilees confirms that and so does the Gospel of Luke. But now if we look um, we have our fact said was 35, the remaining years 40, 403, total 438. Same total 438 in the Samaritan, but instead of 403, remember how the Septuagint is keeping the same remaining years? Well, look, the Septuagint has 430 remaining years. That looks like a scribal error that they were trying to keep the 403 remaining years, but they accidentally wrote it as 430 instead of 403. So because they accidentally wrote it as 430 instead of 403, that changes the final remaining numbers even further. So instead of 538, it becomes 565. Um, then you have, we have uh, Sela. 403 to 303. This time, it's not adding, it's not uh, keeping the remaining years from Masoretic. It's it's subtracting 100. But again, it's confusing the 3 with the 30. So see, Samaritan has 303 remaining years. Septuagint has 330 remaining years. So again, it changes the dates there. Uh, from 433, it changes it to 460. So again, it looks like the Septuagint is the one in error here because they're switching the 3 to 30. Then we have, interestingly, the Septuagint is agreeing with the Samaritan in this one instance for the rem total remaining years. Masoretic has 464. Uh, Samaritan and Septuagint have 404 as the remaining. And then, um, let's see here. Um So 34 in the Masoretic, 430 remaining. And then uh, compared to, but then you look at uh, the Samaritan and the Septuagint, and they actually agree 100% across the board. 134, not 430 remaining years, 270 remaining years for a total of 404. Now take a look here. The difference between 404 and 464, it's 60 years. So it looks like the Masoretic version was accidentally off by 60 years for the, the total remaining years. And because the total remaining years was different, they altered, uh, excuse me, the total age when they died was off by 60 years. And because of that, they altered the remaining years to agree with the, 
the extra 60 years for the age of when he died. So 464 versus 404 in the final two, uh, Samaritan and Septuagint, okay? So uh, Peleg and Reu, both are 239 for the total number of years, and both are 339 in the Septuagint. Serug, 30, followed by 200, total 230. Uh, Masoretic, Samaritan, 130, followed by 100, 230. Same total, but Septuagint, once again, 130, uh, but 200, just like the Masoretic has. So they didn't subtract it this time for a total of uh, 330. And then, okay, now let me stop there for a second. So why does the Septuagint not subtract the 100 when they when it did so in chapter 5? But the S Samaritan does do that. Why? Interestingly, Samaritan is the only one of the three versions which has the full formula. So in chapter 5, the formula is they were born at this year, the remaining years, and they were this age when they died. That's the, that's the th formula in chapter 5. All three versions agree in chapter 5. But in chapter 11, the Masoretic and Septuagint have a shorter formula. The formula is how many years they were when they had a son, how many remaining years of their life. It doesn't give the, the total number of years when they died. Because of that, the Septuagint version of the scribes were confused by that, and so they didn't subtract the 100 when they did that because they didn't have the total to try to correct. Like, they didn't have the total as a frame of reference to keep track of. Because they didn't have the total, they didn't have the total in mind when they were adding the 100 years in, in that section. But the, the Samaritan has the full thing. It has, it has the how old they were when they had a son, how, the remaining years, and it has the total. Therefore, because they have the total, they know the correct number of, of total years, so they can subtract the 100 uh, and keep it in harmony with the total number of years. And I believe the original text did have that full formula, and that's why, like I said, for the Masoretic, it's 464 for Eber versus 404. I believe that's because the original text had the full formula there, and it said 464 for the, the, the total years in the one copy accidentally, uh, or they misread it. It originally said 404, and the extra 60 somehow appeared there uh, by accident. Um, and because of that, the remaining years were altered uh, in the Masoretic to agree with the total number of years. But then in the Masoretic, the total number of years for all the people in chapter 11 is removed. And they just have the, the year they were born or how old they were when they, when they had their son and how many remaining years. Septuagint the same, but like I said, the Samaritan has the full formula where, where it adds the, remain, the, the total number of years when they died. So, um, and then, then we go down to Nahor, and this one, uh, the the Samaritan agrees with the Masoretic in the total number of years, 148, um, but it differs quite significantly in the in uh, the remaining years and how old. So Nahor, 29 years. And then remaining is 119. Samaritan 79 when he was when he had his son, remainder of 69 for a total of 148. Peculiarly, Septuagint has 179. It agrees with the, the um, Samaritan with 79. It's 100 less. It's 100 more. Samaritan is 100 less. 79. But then, if it adds 100. That's too old. That's older than 148. So, uh, interestingly, the 125 remaining years for Septuagint is actually pretty close to the remaining years for Nahor, 119. It's only off by six. But the total for Septuagint is 304. Very different, right? And then 
Um, but it's interesting that the Masoretic and Samaritan agree with the, the total number of years, and the Septuagint and Samaritan agree with the 79 part in how, how old they were when they had the son Terah. And then if you scroll down a little bit so I could see uh, Terah and Abram. Okay, and so the final thing here is um, we have uh, 70 years is the same between all three. But they all differ as to how old he was when he died. <laughs> so for some reason, they changed the remaining years. So the remaining years are 145 remaining years for Masoretic, total of 205. The, oh, this is so weird. Okay. All right. Let me start with Samaritan. 70 years old when he had his son, Abram. He remain, lived after 75 for a total of 145. Masoretic has, he's 70 years old. And then it takes the total, 145, as the remaining years. Now, remember, Samaritan has the full formula. The Masoretic doesn't. So because of that, it might have had that mistake accidentally. Where the where the remain the total 145 was mistaken as as the number for the remaining years, so the total age of Terra from Samaritan is the remaining years for Masoretic for a total of 205 years. Now you go to the Septuagint, and the Septuagint has the total age of Terra 205 as the remaining years. For Terra. That's a very odd coincidence. And so, so uh, 205 after 70 total is 275 years in uh, in the uh, Septuagint version for how old Terra was when he died. Um, and then we have Abram. And Abram was, uh, oh yeah, it's the same across all three. All right, so now, like I said, Book of Jubilees completely disagrees with all three versions, throwing a wrench into this because it has no agreements with any of these dates whatsoever. Um, so it goes off on its own tangent in that sense. But I actually agree with the Jubilees dates. I believe those dates are accurate. Um, so... Which version is correct here for chap chapter uh, chapter 11 of Genesis? There's some wildly different readings in these verses. Uh, but now take a look for a second. So how old, how, how many years after creation was Abraham born? According to the Masoretic, 1948. According to the Samaritan, 2249. According to the Septuagint, 3414. So if you go with the Masoretic, that's the, that's the youngest, 1948 years after creation when Abraham was uh, born. But the Septuagint says it's 3,414. That's way, 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 way later. Uh, that that is um, a total of of 1,450 about about 1,450 years extra that the Septuagint has. So you can see if the scribes wanted it to look like the, the ancient past of the Bible was far older in, in agreement with the other cultures, they added 1,500 years about to make the Bible 1,500 years older than the other copies say. Now the Samaritan earlier, it was the youngest. It was the uh, the least number of years from creation to the flood, 1,307. But because Septu uh, Samaritan adds 100 in chapter 11 for each one, whereas the Masoretic has 100 less, that ultimately creates the effect that the S Samaritan chronology is actually longer than the Masoretic. So the Masoretic has 300 extra years, 350 extra years before the flood. Because like I said, Jubilees, testifies and Samaritan two witnesses for the 
earlier reading of 1,308 years when the flood occurred. So uh, Masoretic has 1,656. That's an extra 350 years prior to the flood. But from 1656 to 1948 in the Masoretic, that's only 300 years about in the Masoretic versus the um, Samaritan from 1307 all the way to 2249. That's 950 years. So while the Masoretic has an extra 300 uh, years before the flood, it has it has um, 650 years less than the Samaritan after the flood. So because of that, it actually adjusts the chronology to where um, the Masoretic had Abraham born in 1948. And what's interesting is the Book of Jubilees has a date that's almost exactly the same as the Masoretic date for when Abraham was born. The difference is, I believe, the difference is based on whether the Jubilee is 50 years or 49 years. Um, 50 years, I think, brings it around 1948, like what we have here. Um, I had to double check this, by the way, the Jubilee thing that I'm talking about, uh, if that's the if that's the resource for this. But um, uh, according to Jubilees, Abraham is born like, what's the, I forget the exact, but it's something like, I'm sorry. Um, I'm reading this wrong. So Abraham is born no, I know. I know. I got. I got this right. Sorry. No, no. I got this right. Okay. So, it looks like, I think Abraham was born according to Book of Jubilees around the eighteen hundred and eighty years. So around the time Masoretic says Terah was born is when Jubilees says Abraham was born. So they're really close, um, even though they differ wildly in the chronology. They somehow are lining up pretty close, and so that's a, also an interesting thing. So, um, but if you look, uh, the number of years, the, the years are significantly younger in Masoretic than in chapter 11 compared to, compared to chapter five. But then you have, ter like, look, if you look at this chart, uh, if you scroll up a little bit so you can see more of the chapter 11 chart. Yeah, that's good. So 35, no, that's too high. Uh, j just all the, all the ones uh, are fact said and below. Yeah, so see, as you, so you have our fact said was 35 years old when he had a son. Selah, 30. Eber, 34. Peleg, 30. Reu, 32. Serug, 30. Neho, 29. But all of a sudden, Terah is 70. That's a big jump. And then Abram, 100. These are big jumps. Um, well, according to Jubilees, oh, wait, and then, and then the Septuagint and Samaritan, it's, it's, it's much larger. It's a hundred, it's over a hundred. Now, according to Genesis, Abraham, it was considered absurd that Abraham had a son that old when he was a hundred years old. That was implausible. That suggests the Samaritan and Septuagint reading readings are not correct because if they, they all, it was consistently having someone, a son, over the age of 100. And so if you look, Serug, um, Serug, uh, wait, let's see here. So Abraham had, according to, um, according to this, uh, Abraham had a son when he was 100 years old, 1948 years after creation in the Masoretic, right? okay? Uh, the Samaritan 22 and 49 years after creation was when Abraham was 100 years old and he had a son. 
And I can't see uh, for Abram. Okay, 34, 14 years after creation when uh, Abram was 100 uh, and had his son Isaac. Now, take a look. Uh, now, you can scroll up just a little bit. Like there. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, so if we look. So Abraham... According to the uh, Samaritan, it was absurd when Abraham had a son at the age of 100, right? But, so it's 2249. Now let's take a look at all the dates there. So, Selah died before that time. Abraham died before that time. Peleg died before that time from the Samaritan. Uh, Reu died before that time. But Serug, um, so Serug was alive when and had a son at 130 years. Um, let's see. So, so the man Serug had a son at 130 years, and he didn't die until Abraham was about 50 years old. So Abraham knew Ser or knew of Serug still alive and having a son over the age of 100 and then nahor um well nahor is at 79 um and then uh but the septuagint has 179 so if you scroll down just a tiny bit just a tiny to, to show abram again so, okay, if you go to the Septuagint, because remember, some people were saying earlier that the Septuagint is the is the uh, correct, uh, they, they believe. Um, so if you look here, so Abraham had his son when he was 100 years old, so 34, 14. Take a look. Uh, Nahor, um, let's see, when, when was, uh, okay, Abraham was born... 3344 after creation. That means that he also was alive when uh, Serug was alive, who, ha who had a son over 100, and so did Nahor over... Um, uh, he had a son uh, over the age of 100, according to Septuagint, which would not seem strange to Abraham because people in his own life had a son over the age of 100. But if you go to the Masoretic, which has the shorter readings, then you see that... Um, that none of them have a son over the age of 100. Uh, so it's consistent with the view of shorter, shorter uh, periods of time. Um, so... Like the fact that Abraham was so shocked that he could have a son at 100 makes more sense with the smaller readings of the Masoretic and the smaller readings of Jubilees. Jubilees is not as small as Masoretic, but it's all the readings of Jubilees are below 70, if I recall correctly. They're all below, like they're all around like you know mid, like kind of, kind of like the same numbers in chapter five. They're, they're like in the like uh, 60s, 50s ish. Um, so uh, let's see here. Another interesting thing is that uh, go, go to Shem, go to Shem. So Shem was born 1558. When did he die? 2158. Um, 1209 in uh, in the um, Samaritan, 1809 in the sorry. Uh, so I, I I'm confusing myself in my head. I I'm not sure if I said the right thing or not. So Shem Masoretic 1558 when he was born and he died 2158 years after creation. Uh, Samaritan 1209. 
was when he was born after creation and died 1809 after creation. And Shem 2144 and uh, died uh, 2744 after creation. Now, keep those numbers in mind. Uh, let's see. So can you scroll so we, I, you could still see Shem, but also can you see Abram? Is there a way to do that? Uh, it's probably not. Um, or maybe if you minus to make it a little bit smaller, the yeah. zoom. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, okay, so we have, so we have uh, 2158 is when Shem died. Now, when was Abraham born? He was born... 1948 that that means shem might have met abram right that's what some people say they say shem is melchizedek right you probably have heard some people say that before now take a look our fact said he died when uh in, in all these cases that means abraham was alive when abraham was alive and potentially met um all these people, uh, he 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 met all his ancestors: Shem, Arphaxad, said, Canaan, Sela, Eber, Peleg. Actually, yeah, Peleg died. According to Masoretic, he died around the same time as Nahor, and they all died um, in Abraham's lifetime. So they were all alive, and he could have talked to all, any of them, and. Um, and that means they all had their language confused in the Tower of Babel, and they 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 did not speak their language anymore, uh, their original language. So Shem, Arphaxad, Canaan, Selah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nahor, Terah. That's very weird for him to be alive during all that time. Um, and if you look, Shem actually dies after Abraham dies, according to the Mass verdict. That's very weird. But now, if you go to the um, Samaritan, I don't know. Is there a way you can like move the windows without scrolling up or down? Can you move my move our windows or no? It, no, I can't do that. It doesn't do that. Okay. No. Um. So let's just uh, keep in mind. We'll just keep in mind. Okay. Uh, Eighteen oh nine is for Shem. So if you just scroll down, just the one. One box, so eight a uh, little bit up, just so I could see our facts. That yeah, so what was it like? Eighteen oh nine. Yeah. So, um, so now we take a look. When was Abraham born? Twenty two forty nine. Um. Uh, yeah, twenty two forty nine. So that means, uh. Shem was long since dead, according to the Samaritan. Our fact said, dead, before he was even born. Selah, before Abraham was even born, dead. Same thing with Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug. They were all dead before Abraham was even born. And then Nahor... Um, so Serug is his great grandfather. That's Abraham's great grandfather. So, um, so according. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. So Serug was alive when, because Abraham was was. Um, uh, I keep I keep I keep I keep getting this confused. Okay. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So his great grandfather was dead before he was born, according to Samaritan. So that means that that's consistent with normal things, uh, normal life, where typically your great grandfather has died or is close to dying by the time you're born. Then you know, depending if you're lucky, you might get to live uh, for for some of your childhood or even into early adulthood with your great-grandfather or great-grandmother still alive, but not much longer than that. And to have your great-great would be 
very unusual. So Samaritan actually agrees with the way nature is after the flood, because, you know, prior to the flood, they lived a long time. So, of course, you, you could be alive for all those ancestors. But after the flood, they lived significantly less, which, which reduced um, uh, the generation overlap. The overlap would be reduced. So because of the reduction, you now, just like now, you didn't live. You didn't uh, get to see your great great greats and everything. You get to you got to see your grandfather, your, your grandparents, and your great grandparents, uh, typically. So Samaritan agrees with the the common uh, life experience that we have, the shortened life experience after the flood. Septuagint, same thing. We've got Shem, our fact set, all the way down to Serug. They're dead. Only his grandfather, again, is alive during the time Abraham is born. Again, fits fits very much with, uh, with the way things are, naturally. Then we have... Um, we have, uh, so, so Samaritan and Septuagint have a natural order to a uh, life cycle in generational succession, but the Masoretic has the, like I said, it's kind of absurd if you think about it, it has every single ancestor all the way back to Noah, uh, alive during the time of Abraham. And in fact, um, In fact, uh, Selah, Eber, and Shem all die after Abraham dies. Very weird and unlikely. It's, it's implausible. Um, that's because the Masoretic dates are significantly shorter. Very short. Uh, if, the, if Jubilees is correct, on the other hand, their dates, like I said, its dates are typically closely around like 60, 50 type of range. Uh, so if you look at the Jubilees dates, then what we see is we see that um, instead it agrees more with the Samaritan and Septuagint in terms of generational succession um, where Abraham like uh, most of the ancestors are dead before Abraham is born, but it, it actually goes back a little bit further where like he's alive when his great grandfather is and, 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 and maybe even great grandfather, uh, great, great potentially, um, but not farther than that. So um, the fact that Jubilees, Samaritan and Septuagin all have a more sensible thing where um the earlier patriarchs die well before Abraham is born. That's in harmony. If, if you scroll, if you scroll up to uh, scroll up to Noah for a sec, when does Noah die? Noah dies. Two thousand and six years after creation. So, so that means Noah himself was still alive when Abraham was born. In every other version, he's not alive. Uh, Septuagint, not alive. Samaritan and Jubilees, Noah's sin long since dead. Um, so the Masoretic chronology doesn't make sense in that way. Uh, so now let's see. Um, did you want to pull up Jubilees for me, the book of Jubilees? Um, so I do have a, I did go through this once, one time, and wrote down sort of like a reconstructed text, text of Genesis, where, which had the Jubilees dates for chapter 11. But I need to just quickly uh, find that file on my computer. Um, but if you want to pull up Jubilees, we can kind of... Um, Actually, eh, maybe, maybe maybe you don't have to. I don't know. Um, 
But like I said, I'm going to pull up my my what, cha what chapter? Um. Well, it, the problem is it's spread. It's spread throughout. Uh, like it gives like each person. Um. So okay. Uh, let's see. Maybe you can share your screen. I might do that. Let me just. Uh, yeah. Or it's possible I might just say. Um, I might have you. Uh, I might tell you direct you to the verses. Okay. Um. Whoops. I know I have it on my computer. I just need to. Basically, one time a while back, I went through most of the Old Testament and did like variants in a like a sort of like a preliminary thing. Um, but it, it was very. It had a lot of errors in it, so I didn't release it to people. But I use it occasionally for a frame of reference. Um, Actually, I could just get it from my phone. I'm pretty sure I have it on my phone. I'm trying to find it on my computer. But uh, actually, so at this time, while I'm looking this up, if you want, you can uh, look at some of the questions maybe or or some of the comments just to yeah, sure. uh, take while I'm looking this up. If anyone has a specific question for Onia, just if you can just put at Onia, that'll make it a little bit easier to sort through. Well, there were some interesting things that people said about what we were talking about. Here's a question from Caesar. What was what was the biggest sin that lowered lifespan? Sex or animal killings? What would you say to that, Onia? Um let's see here. I I think uh well, of course, it wasn't just animals. You know, it was uh, there was uh, what's it called? Um, cannibalism and uh, things like that. So I, I think I think that had a lot more to do with it um, because you think about it, the, the the sex thing that only harms the bloodline of the ones that have been polluted. Like whereas Noah's bloodline was pure. It didn't have that polluted blood, uh, blood from all these other uh, abominations of the of the giants and things of like that. But um, but the uh, according to scripture, blood that's shed, you know, murder defiles the earth and creates a stench, uh, toxic, you know, so and a curse. Of the land and in fact it's so bad that if someone is murdered in your city you need to atone it's you need to have it atoned for and um if you can't find it's supposed to be atoned for by the death and the shedding of blood of the murderer but if you can't find the murderer it provides a ritual for an animal to be offered in in the place of the murderer as a sacrifice to atone for the blood shed on the earth so that the city will not be cursed 
from that murder. If the if the if that blood is not atoned for, then there will be a sickness upon the land from that shed blood. Uh, and we don't do atonement in, you know, in uh, in the modern world from sacrifices. So because of that, all these murders that happen, they pollute and defile the earth in the communities we live in. So I think it's the the killings that uh, that significantly reduced. Um, but of course, not only that, but um, so I have a belief based on my studies in the last year or so. I believe that demons, when they died, so according to scripture, demons are the descendants, the spirits of the descendants of the of the angels, the watchers, right? Uh, the giants and such. So when the giants died before and during the flood, they died out. But their spirits remained and they became demons. But what's a demon? So in my view, the demons, when they became spirits, their spirits were put inside uh, DNA, molecular or, you know, microscopic DNA. And basically, you know, you've, you've heard of viruses. I believe viruses are demons. They are the bodies of demons, I believe. And so the demons were spreading these diseases. So once these diseases start being spread after the flood, that, that's making people live shorter and shorter lifespans and according to the book of jubilees abraham was like per, like basically the most one of the most righteous men ever to live but it says that because abraham was around wicked people he was in their presence he died younger as a result than he would have he would have lived longer had he not been surrounded by evil so that suggests that if you live in a sinful world or an environment where there's sin all around you and diseases all around you and all kinds of sicknesses spreading everywhere. It's going to shorten lifespan. Even if you're living a righteous life, you're being constantly bombarded by the disgusting nature of sin uh, and diseases that come from sin from all these other wicked people in the world. And because of that, it shortens lifespan for everybody, unfortunately. Very interesting comment. It's not, not necessarily a question, but JC said, no wonder Jesus said, beware of the scribes. Yeah, of course, you know, with all the difference and variants, uh, that uh, they beware of the scribes because the scribes did many changes. And you'd be surprised, like, you know, many, many years ago when I found out the differences between the gene genealogy stuff, that actually really disturbed me. And I like, I don't want to say my faith was shaken because I never doubted my faith, but I kind of was like, didn't know what to do or where to go because it's like, what, how, what should I trust in the Bible type of thing? You know, I was kind of thinking along those lines, but I never doubted like, you know, the core elements of the faith. And I it was kind of like a challenge, not so much the Bible's unreliable, but how can I know? The Bible to be reliable when I know this stuff. But then the more I've studied, the more I've learned that differences between the scribes, they're not random. There's a logic to it, even if it's a bad change, there's a reason for it. So you can actually look and see the changes made or the differences, and you can have an understanding of why those differences are there. So because of that, I would say um, the variants don't disturb me that much anymore it actually enriches my faith because I see the more I learn what the original reading is, the, m the more invested I am in the scriptures and the, and the more difficult it is to me. My computer is slow at the moment. Okay, so I feel the same way, by the way, Onia. Um, exactly. Uh, LXR says, uh, Adonia, so there's three versions of the Bible that are older than the one we have today. I only read yeah, the my King James. computer slow. So if you want, you could say some stuff. Okay. Uh, 
Um, it should I should be normal now. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, that was that was the first time it seems like today, so that's good. Um, so it's not quite okay. So in the original King James English of the Bible, no, I'm just joking. A lot of people treat it as if uh, the original, you know, language of Scripture was the King James Bible. Well, of course, that's not true. But there are people who believe the King James is inspired, divinely inspired version of the Bible. Um, but there's a lot of problems with that. One is the actual preface of the King James says it's not inspired and that, that there are errors in it. And then secondly, so, the, so that means, okay, so firstly, like I said, that preface, so that means they're admitting, the people who made the King James Version are admitting that it's not a perfect version. But secondly, uh, so when you said there's three versions Okay, so King James Version is just a translation, modern translation. That is a translation almost entirely for the Old Testament from the Masoretic text. Masoretic is basically the Hebrew, uh, a, a copy of the Old Testament in Hebrew. Hebrew is the original language it was written in, but doesn't mean that those, those Hebrew copies are the most reliable text that we have. Because... You can change the, what the Hebrew says, but the scribes can change it. So that basically the King James Version is the one version, Masoretic, because it, it follows very closely the Masoretic. They translate pretty much always the Masoretic text. And the, the Masoretic text goes back to around the eight, uh, the ninth century AD, the earliest copy we have, complete copy. But according to the evidence, the Masoretic text is a very ancient version that goes back to the time of the Messiah. Not too much farther than that, but it goes back to around that time. Septuagint, the oldest copy we have of the complete Septuagint, is the 4th century AD. So earlier, 500 years earlier than the Masoretic. It's, it's in Greek. Uh, it's a Greek translation of a Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, but a different Hebrew copy than the Masoretic text that the King James Version is based on. Okay, so those are the two main versions. And then you have the Samaritan. That's only for the first five books, Samaritan. Uh, but you also have Old Latin, which is uh, the translation of the original Septuagint, because there's different versions of the Septuagint over time. So Old Latin is an important witness for that. The Vulgate is a translation of the Masoretic text, a Latin translation in ancient times, uh, in the 4th century. And the Peshitta is an Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. Uh, it was made around a same time frame, uh, 5th century, roughly, uh, AD. And then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are fragments of much older Hebrew copies dating to around 1st century B.C. to 2nd century B.C. So those are significantly more uh, uh, older, and they they show that many of the readings agree with the Septuagint, Masoretic, and sometimes its own readings, own peculiar readings that are not preserved in any other version. So, um, so let me just see here. Okay. So I have this on my phone, the file I want. Now I'm just going to send it to my computer, and then I can, then I can, uh, let's see here. I'm emailing myself the, the file that I made. That, that has the text of um, that I added the Jubilees uh, numbers. Now, I did this a very long time ago, so it's possible one or two of them I might have slightly, the, the, like a slightly wrong number, but for the most part, all these numbers are correct from Jubilees. Uh, but like I said, it's possible like one or two. Two of them I might have because 
um, uh, I remember checking at a later time, not like one or two. That's why I'm saying there might be a slight. Uh, are you? Oh, okay, you were breaking up there a little bit, but I think you're back. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry about that. I, no I don't problem. know what happened there. I think it's because I was trying to d download this PDF file. And, you know, when you sometimes when you do multiple stuff it can cause that um so i'm just going to open it into a tab in the meantime then, we have another, we have another yeah, sure. question here uh if the septuagint is the oldest then why isn't it logical to assume it's correct okay so so here's the problem with the, with the the logic so i do agree generally the older it is um in general the older it is the more likely it is to be uh the correct reading however there's a problem with this and the problem is the source text so we have good reason to believe that the masoretic and Septuagint both go back to around the same time uh, first century bc second century bc they both existed at that time but generation after generation making copies making copies and so throughout the generations of different copies the earliest copy we have of the one version that goes all the way back to first century bc masoretic we have a ninth century copy for the septuagint we have a fourth century copy that goes back to the second century bc yeah, all the way back like it's a copy Copy, 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 all the way back to 2nd century BC. So the issue is, the fact is, um, they're both, they're copies of an earlier version. And it's the earlier version which we have to determine which one's more accurate. So the Septuagint is older. We have older copies. But... Um, it's a translation and copy of a this particular earlier copy from the second century BC, and that copy may have had errors. So every time that's copied, it, they're copying that that error in that in when in that original translation they made that error, or they they had a Hebrew manuscript that had that error. And they translated it and they continue to translate that error. Likewise, they might have had the correct reading that the Masoretic doesn't have. And they and they translated it correctly and they keep copying it correctly. So the Masoretic and the Septuagint, even though the Masoretic is a later cop a later version, it's not a cop, it's not a related, they're, they're unrelated copies. In other words, um, like it's it would make your your logic would make sense if they're both like if the masoretic is is simply in the same line as the septuagint but they're not in the same line there are two different lines streams of of copies and therefore they have to go back to the original copies that they're from and those original copies were not perfect so sometimes that original copy of the Masoretic was correct, and the Septu and, and and the Septuagint original copy was wrong, and vice versa. Sometimes the original Masoretic copy, way long ago, that we don't have anymore, but is the source of all Masoretic copies. Sometimes it had the wrong reading, and the Septuagint had the, the original copy, had the correct reading. So because of that, you can't judge solely based on the time. The length of time you have to also judge um th there's 
there's uh okay my now my is freezing up again uh i'm just waiting for it itself sorry about this yeah no problem uh it's because i have this it's because i have the pdf i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure i think it down because uh the 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 oldest uh how do i put this um Okay, there's there's textual criticism principles that can be used to distinguish which reading is correct. But one thing against the Septuagint is the fact that it's a translation. So because of that, translations always add things that are not in the original. And they, they sometimes change things, but not always. So um, because of that, the Septuagint is going to be inferior in some variants, some readings, simply by the fact that they translated it. And the, the error came in the original translation and was just because they didn't translate it as literally or they misunderstood the Hebrew or things like that. Um, whereas the Masoretic text, it has the Hebrew. So even if the, the you know, the Masoretic, like I said, they, they add vowel markings to tell you their interpretation, but you can ignore their interpretation and look at their Hebrew letters and say, oh, okay, I think this Hebrew word should actually be interpreted this way. So the advantage of the Masoretic is it has the Hebrew, it, not necessarily the original Hebrew, but it has a copy of the text in Hebrew. And therefore, there's more opportunity for the correct reading to be found in the Masoretic reading than the translation. But the Greek translation, the Septuagint translation, often translates the Hebrew text, which is superior to the Masoretic. That therefore, I place the Septuagint on a very high level of importance. Basically, equal. In my view, they're basically equal. Um, but the Septuagint, I probably would put slightly higher of importance, due to the fact that so many of their variants are, uh, I would argue, superior. But in some cases, the Masoretic is superior. And what I have found, so a few years back. I kind of defaulted under Septuagint is like 95% correct. I've since changed my mind on that based on, on the fact that I've learned a lot more about Hebrew and textual criticism stuff. And what I've come to find is that it's actually significantly less than what I thought. So Septuagint is not 95% correct and Masoretic usually wrong if it conflicts. Instead, I find that it's actually kind of more like 50-50 where half of the time Septuagint is the correct one and the other half of the time uh, Masoretic is. And it differs by book. Some books, Septuagint is much more reliable. Other books, it's not. So um, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, book-by-book -book basis. Because the thing to keep in mind, the Septuagint was not translated by a single person or a single group. And they didn't do all the books in one text. Instead, it was like some random people were like, I'm going to translate this book of the Bible. But they didn't say Bible. They just were like, you know, I'm going to translate book of Judges today. And then, you know, we translate Judges. Some other group was like, you know what? I'd really like a copy of Joshua in Greek. Let's translate that. So it was different groups of people translating Old Testament books. It wasn't the same group translating all the entire Old Testament so because of that, not every book was translated the same level of accuracy and importance for the Septuagint as others. Um, okay, so if you want, is there any other thing that sounds interesting that's kind of like related to this? Or if if not, I'll go back to uh, what we've been, what we're going to be talking about. Well, we can we can answer or you can answer a few more questions, or you can just go to where you want to what you got up there. That's fine, whatever you want to do. Okay, uh, I think we will go back to 
what I'm going to sh uh, show from Jubilees. Now, like I said, I did a um, I I did a version of Genesis where I added or I altered the numbers to agree with Jubilees, just to kind of like see what it would look like. So, um, I think I think I can share the screen. No, I, I don't need to share the screen. Um, I'm just going to read from it. Uh, so here's what you could do. Could you pull that chart again for me? So people could have it as a reference while I'm reading these uh, differences. So you, if you want to scroll down to... So notice that Shem's the same. So we don't need to say... We don't need to see Shem's because it's the same in all three versions. And Jubilees as well. It's all the same. So, But our facts add is where it differs. All right, so here's what I've got in, for our facts app. So I have our facts had lived 60 and five years, begot, and he begot Canaan. And our facts had lived after he'd begotten Canaan 373 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of our facts had were. 438 years, and he, and he died. And Canaan lived 50 and 7 years and begot Selah. And Canaan lived after he had begotten Selah 403 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 460 years, and he died. And Selah lived 71 years and begot Eber. And Selah lived after he had begotten Eber 363 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Selah were 433 years, and he died. And Eber lived 64 years, and begot Peleg. And Eber lived, after he begotten Peleg, 340 years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Eber were 404 years, and he died. And Peleg lived 60 years, and begot Reu. And Peleg lived, after he had begotten Reu, 179 years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Peleg were 239 years, and he died. And Reu lived 59 years, and begot Serug. And Reu lived after he had begotten Serug 180 years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Reu were 239 years, and he died. And Serug lived 57 years, and begot Nehor. And Serug lived after he had begotten Nehor 173 years, and we got sons and daughters, and all the days of Serug were 230 years, and he died. And Nahor lived 63 years, and we got Terah. And Nahor lived after he begotten Terah 85 years, and we got sons and daughters, and all the days of Nahor were 148 years, and he died. Okay? So, so I don't know if you guys were following along as I was reading that, but that's basically what we have from Jubilees, the, di the different uh, readings there. So, so you know, you, like I said, it's it's all close to around sixty-ish um, for all these people, and so when when you have that, so you, so thir thirteen, our fact said was born in thirteen oh nine. So if we if we take a look at let me let me see a fact said so i'm just gonna do round uh round dating here so our fact said 60 60 years um so a fact said had a son sela so like so like 13 13, all right, let's say 1375 around, okay? So Selah was born around 1375. Then when did Selah? Oh, no, that's Caden. I forgot. Caden has a, there's the extra Caden in Jubilee, so. Uh, and then, okay, then we have, Like fourteen thirty or something around there, 
for around 1430 years after creation is when Canaan had Salem. Actually, wow, that actually, because Canaan drops out, it's almost exactly the same as Samaritan, uh, what Samaritan says. I'm just going to make it easier. I'm just going to round it to what, what, uh, what uh, Samaritan says, 1444 for Selah. Okay. So, okay, so 70 for Aver. So we got 15, like 1515 around when Aver was born. So 1515 plus... Let's see here. Um, okay, so Abraham was born when Abr was alive. Now this is important because Abr, um, his name is the same as Hebrew. The word for Hebrew, it's the same root, Hebrew and Abr. And, and I believe that's not a coincidence. I think that... The Hebrews come from Aber. They're the descendants of Aber. All the descendants of Aber are Hebrews. And um, so I believe Aber was the one, according to Jubilees, it doesn't say Aber did this, but I, okay, all right, let me rephrase. According to Jubilees, Abraham, you know, after the Tower of Babel, the language of creation was revealed to Abraham, and it says the language of creation was Hebrew. So why would Jubilee say the language of creation is Hebrew? It's naming it after Eber, because like I said, Eber and Hebrew are related. So I think Jubilee is implying there that Hebrew comes from Eber. And it says in Jubilees that Abram got the copies of the scriptures, like Book of Enoch, Book of Noah, from his forefathers. Who would have had that? I believe Aber had the copies. Aber was the one protecting the copies, and he passed it on to Abraham. And that's why it's called Hebrew, because it comes from Aber. So Aber was alive, according to Jubilees, when Abraham was. Okay, uh, 1515, he lived 404 years. So he was... Uh, it was like 19, 1920 around when, years after creation when Aber died. And according to Jubilees, Abraham was like 1880 or something. Okay, so 1515 for Aber. Now let's see where Pe what about Peleg. Um, 60 years. Okay, so 1575. But now take a look, 1575 plus 239. So now, all right, so so look, these earlier ones are 400 years total they lived, right? So um, our facts had a total year of life, 438. Selah, 433. Aver, 404. But all of a sudden, that next generation, it drops significantly. To 239, then 239, 230, 148, 145. It's a downward trend, significant. Whereas, it's, you know, the Septuagint has, uh, it, it drops to 300s, around 300, and then it drops in Abraham's time to 175. Uh, the Samaritan dropping makes more sense. 404, 239, 239, 230, 148. By the way, I believe those final dates agree with Jubilees, the final years of how old they were when they died. I think that is reliable. In in all these other cases, the different variants, most of the time, it's the final number is trustworthy. How many years they old were, were when they died. It's the how old they were when they had a son and how many remaining years that's the unreliable part. So I believe we can trust the Samaritan uh readings for the total number of years when they died so based on that according to jubilees 
Shem died before Abraham was born. Our facts said Canaan, Selah all died before Abraham was born. Abraham did not. He Abraham was, uh, excuse me, Abraham was still alive for about the first 40 years of Abraham's life. Then Peleg died before, uh, died before uh, Abraham was born. And then Reu, let's see, so it's like 1580 or so. So Reu was born, right, Reu had, okay, so let's say 60, um, Okay, so like 1640, Reu. So Rehu died right around the time Abraham was born. So Rehu is the great-great-grandfather. So basically, according to Jubilees, Abraham was only, was only alive during the time when his great-grandfather Grandfather and father were alive. And the one exception is Aber, that one ancestor way back is alive, according to Jubilees. So Aber only. Aber is his, um, let's see, four times great grandfather. So Aber, the four times great grandfather, he alone is still alive in the time. Of Abraham. Beyond that, it's just his great grandfather, uh, grandfather, and his father. And his uh, great great grandfather had just died shortly before he was born, or may have been just alive, just like when he was a baby and then died. So, um, so Jubilees also is very close to Samaritan and Septuagint in the sense that. Um, Abraham was not a lot like was not living when all his forefathers were alive, like Masoretic has. It doesn't the, the Masoretic version doesn't make that much sense in that sense. Um, so okay, so Reu was 16, 1640. Um Okay, and then Serug, let's see here. Okay, we're running it to 60 again. Um, so 1700. And then Nahor. Eighty-five, so seventeen eighty-five. Hold on, I think I'm. I think I missed one uh, patriarch um, in this for the for these numbers. Uh, but but I yeah uh, Abraham was born around like 1880 ish, so um, Tara was born 1810 ish. Uh, and um, Sorry, one second here. So 1750 would be when Sarah had a son. Sixteen ninety would be Rayu having a son. 
1630 around I'm, I'm doing some rounding uh pay leg so 1630 pay leg aber uh i'm not going to do the math here but basically i remember doing this before and what i told you is correct that uh the math works out that uh aber is still alive in the time of, of abraham uh, and all the others are not all the others earlier and um Peleg and Reu Peleg's not alive and Reu might just barely be alive uh like when he's a baby and then dies um and so he only knows Serug his his great grandfather Nahor and Terra in his life which is more in harmony with the way things are where because life has declined, you don't have these generations, you know, 10 generations back overlapping each other. That's, that's almost unheard of. You have rare examples in our modern times where, you know, someone might live to 120 and they might, you know, theater, you know, hypothetically, you could have someone have a son every, you know, every 20 years they have a son. So, you, you know, your, your son is 20 and he gets married and has a son. So you become a grandfather. Let's, let's say you're 20 years old, you have a son. Okay, so at 20 years old, you're a father. 40 years old, you're a grandfather. 60, great-grandfather. 80, great-great, you know, and so on and so forth. So all the way to 120, you could have lots of generations. But most of the time, it's not every 20 years. Instead, it's more like 30, uh, around 30 to 35, typically. So um, by that time, you know, so 30 years, you're a father, 60 years, you become a grandfather. According to the Torah or the Old Testament law of Moses uh, in um, Leviticus, 60 years old is when you become an old person. So it makes sense that you become a grandfather around the age of 60. That's, that's actually pretty reasonable, sensible. And then around 90, you become a great grandfather. Again, that's quite in line with the way things are. And then if you were lucky to reach it to 120, you could become a great, great grandfather. Um, but for the people who like reproduce, like as soon as they can in 20 years, you could have as many as, um, let's see. Uh, okay, so 40, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count with uh, on my fingers with the greats. Okay, so 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. So you could die at the age of 120 and have lived to see your great, 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 great grandson or granddaughter. However, like I said, that's almost unheard of to have a son every 20 years. You know what I mean? So because of that, the normal thing is that you pretty much only live to see your grandfather and your great grandfather uh, for a small part of your life, your great grandfather. So Jubilees agrees with that short. You see your grandfather, your great-grandfather, and maybe if you're lucky, great-great-grandfather. Septuagint and Samaritan agree with that. Masoretic has every single person back to Noah alive during the time of Abraham. Very illogical in my opinion. So that's the extent of Jubilees basically. Um, and one other thing about Jubilees is it tells us that they entered the promised land. No, the Exodus happened in the year 2410 after creation. We, you know, there's 40 years of wandering in the desert. So that's 2,500 years. No, it's 2,450 years after um, creation when they entered the promised land. So what's cool about that is if you do is if you do the on the calculator, you do uh, 2450 divided by 49, you get 50. What that means is that it's 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 like a amazing harmony of of a. Uh, the numbers here. So 
According to Book of Jubilees, basically, uh, from the time of creation to the time of the wait, hold on. Okay, so there's 49 jubilees, and then in uh, the 50th jubilee, that is when uh, they leave Egypt and go into the promised land. And at the very end of that 50th jubilee, they enter the promised land. So that's interesting because the 50th year, the year after the 49th year is the year of Jubilee. So Jubilees is ba book of Jubilees is basically saying that like there was 49 Jubilees and then the 50th Jubilee, it was like a, it was like a year of Jubilee of Jubilees. Like it, it, it was the Jubilee of Jubilees where basically it, it was like a significant Jubilee where uh, their freedom was declared because in the year of Jubilee freedom was declared. So the freedom of Israel from Egypt and they return to their land. According to the Torah and the book of Leviticus, during the year of Jubilee, all the land gets returned to the proper owner. And according to the Jubilees, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, originally belonged to Israel, the Israelites. It belonged to the line of Shem, but Canaan, the line of Ham, stole it illegally, unrighteously stole the land. And so the land was never theirs. The Canaan never deserve that land. The land was always supposed to be for the line of Shem. And so uh, so 400 and uh, so the first 49 Jubilees happened and then the 50th Jubilee was like the Jubilee of Freedom and the land being returned to them just like the year of Jubilee has. So that's a cool thing right there. And then um, then what's really interesting with 49, uh, years for a Jubilee rather than 50, because some people believe, like I said, believe it's 50, but 49 is the correct view for, for multiple reasons. For one, the book of Daniel agrees with the 49 year interpretation. 70 weeks of years were prophesied 70 times seven, a total of 490 years. A week is a seven-year period in, in Scripture. And so Daniel speaks of a period of 490 years. Why would he speak of 490 years if a jubilee is 50 years and, and he would have spoken 500 years? The fact that 490 perfectly matches 10 jubilees means that, that Daniel agrees with the 49-year interpretation. Secondly, according to 1 Kings, I forget which chapter it is, but 1 Kings literally says that after the exodus occurred, there was 480 years till when Solomon built the temple, the first temple. Um, could you bring up that verse, actually, uh, in 1 Kings? I don't remember which verse it is, but if you go to, like, Blue, uh, Blue Letter Bible or Bible Gateway or any of those type of websites or resources where you could search verses just say um don't do first kings just do like uh 480 or something see if that works if if that doesn't work you could you might have to do you might have to do 80th okay 80th try, try 80th 480th There we are. Yeah. Okay. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord, the temple, the house of Yahweh. So 480 years after the Exodus, he built the, he started building the temple. Well, guess what Jubilee says? It says that. 
it basically says that 10 years into the Jubilee, into the 50th Jubilee, is when they um, is when they left, uh, when they did the, the exodus and left Egypt. So basically, according to Jubilees, 10 years, the first 10 years of that Jubilee, they were still in Egypt. And then they, so 400 years, 480 years later equals 490. So that's, I can't, that can't be coincidence either. You have Jubilee saying it's 10 years, the first 10 years of the Jubilee, they were in Egypt, and then they left Egypt after the 10th year. So 10 plus 480 is the perfect 490, the 10 Jubilees. So you got 10 Jubilees from the time, it's, it's roughly the time where Moses, uh, Moses uh, started a family from around that time. And 10 Jubilees later is when the temple be began to be built. Then you have a middle unknown period from the first temple to the decree. The decree is the decree mentioned in the book of Daniel, where... Daniel mentions the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. From that decree to the time of the cutting off of the anointed one in the middle of the week when a covenant is established and the sacrifices are ceased and sin is sealed up, right? It's 70 weeks, 70 sevens. It's and it divides it into two. For the first group, it's actually three. Actually, it divides it into three. The first is seven sevens, which is forty nine years, and it's um and it's sixty two sevens for a total of sixty nine years, and the final excuse me sixty nine week years, and the final week year a week year being seven years, is the seventieth one. And in the middle of the 70th one, the anointed one is cut off and a covenant is established and uh, sacrifices cease and the, the salvation is made and sin is sealed away. This is all from Daniel. So Daniel is saying that from the time of the temple being built to the time of the Messiah dying is about 10 jubilees. So... Um, now, what does the Messiah say? Okay, by the way, the temple is not just the building. The temple includes the courtyards, right? It includes all the courtyards, according to Scripture. A temple is not just the building itself, the temple building itself, but also all the things around the temple that are part of the holy place. So there's three courtyards, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, for the temple. And so, uh, the temple was built, but the rest of Jerusalem was not built yet uh, in the time of the return from the Babylonian exile. So, when the Messiah said, M Messiah said uh, that he will tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And then the Jews replied and said, it took 46 years to build the temple. So, interestingly... Um, Daniel divides it into seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven weeks are seven periods of seven years, 49 years. Well, guess what? 46 is very close to 49. And what is those 49 years, it says in Daniel? During those years uh, is when the holy city of Jerusalem, the, the temple city, is to be built, rebuilt. So from that time to the time of the Messiah, it, it fits nearly exactly 10 jubilees. So that means that this is, this is a pattern. This is not coincidence. So you've got 49 jubilees from the time of creation all the way to the time of like Moses having a family or something. And then from then, you have 10 jubilees 
to when the first temple started to be built. Then you have an unknown period of time. Then you have 10 more jubilees to when the Messiah dies. So based on this pattern, the middle period almost certainly is also 490 years. So you have 49 jubilees in the beginning, followed by 10 jubilees from the Exodus, right around the Exodus, to the time of the first temple being starting to be built. 490 years from the starting to build the first temple to when the uh, when the decree to rebuild Jerusalem is made, and then 490 years or 10 jubilees from when that decree is made until the Messiah dies. So if we, if we backtrack, the Messiah, we don't know exactly when the Messiah uh, died or was born, although evidence seems to point to him being born around the 4th century B.C., and then dying, potentially dying. Um, so evidence seems to say that he was that he died around the age of 33. So uh, he, if he was born 4 BC, he would have been. Uh, it would have been the 29th year uh, AD when he died. Um, if he was born in the first century BC, like like the older scholarship said, then he would have died around 33 BC. Uh, excuse me, 33 AD is when he would have died. So that's a range, though, between between 29 AD and 33 AD is when he died, right? So all we need is his year of death, and then we use this jubilee principle. Take his year of death, and when, by the way. It's not the exact year of his death when the Jubilee is to be backtracked because it says in Daniel that he that he dies in the middle of the last week, in the very middle of it. So that means he didn't die at the very end of the Jubilee, but like a couple years before the Jubilee ended. So because of that, you have to add like three years. So you get to either like 33 AD or 36 AD. And then you subtract the Jubilees. So from 33 to 36 AD, subtract 10 Jubilees. And that brings us to around 454 or, or a little earlier, 458 uh, BC, when the decree was made. And that is the same year that uh, history tells us um, when the year of Artaxerxes when Ezra tells us that was that year of Artaxerxes reign um, or maybe Nehemiah Ezra or Nehemiah they tell us that's when uh, the, the Jerusalem started to be built so it was like 458 BC so from then going farther back you then add another 490 years so 458 uh, plus 500, make it easier, 458, 458 plus 500 is uh, 958. Subtract 10, it's like 948. So that's when the first temple started to be built, around 948 BC. That was the time of Solomon. Subtract 480 years uh, okay, I'm doing this all in my head, so hold on. Um, okay, I said 48, 948, okay. So 948 minus, again, 500. So 948 minus 500 is... Uh, Fourteen, uh, forty-eight, and then you subtract uh, twenty, so fourteen twenty-eight around. This approximate, right? Approximate. Fourteen twenty-eight BC is when the Exodus happened. Fourteen thirty-eight BC, roughly, uh, is when the Jubilee started, and you subtract forty-nine Jubilees. So, 
um, 1438, let's see, negative 1438, minus 49 times 49 brings us to about the year 3838 BC, approximately, give or, uh, give or take a couple years. Uh, when that is when the creation occurs according to this formula. So I believe this is a very this is a very um, reliable indicator to, to, to help us know where we are in creation and chronology. So you like I said, you, you take the Messiah's year of death, add three years to it because of what Daniel says. Subtract 10 jubilees. That's when the uh, that's when the building of Jerusalem began. Subtract ten jubilees. That's when the first temple started to be built. Subtract ten jubilees, or subtract four hundred eighty years. That's when the Exodus happened. Subtract ten years. That's the beginning of the jubilee. Subtract forty nine jubilees. You're at the year of creation. So that brings us to thirty eight around thirty eight forty BC. Um, and I'm pretty confident that that is right around the year of creation, according to the testimony of Book of Jubilees and, uh, and like different witnesses like Genesis, uh, the different manuscripts, when you, when you link them with Jubilees, when you see what First King says, when you see what Book of Daniel says, it all adds up to a harmony of, of Jubilees. And uh, Book, of D Book of Enoch has 364 days in the year. Why? Because it's divisible by seven. The Sabbath occurs on the seventh day. Why? Because it's divisible by seven. Uh, in the Torah, Law of Moses, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in particular, so there's a Feast of Weeks, right? In our copies of the Law of the Old Testament. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls copies, there's three Feasts of Weeks. There's the first, which is the Feast of the First Fruits of Wheat. Then there's first Feast, uh, excuse me, Feast of the first fruits of wine and Feast of the first fruits of oil. And they're all separated by 49 days or seven actual weeks of days. So the way it works in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Law of Moses copy found there, it spells it out as in the Temple Scroll. It has it as, and, and by the way, the Temple Scroll, the evidence indicates it's the it's an original version of the Book of Deuteronomy that had extra laws in it. Uh, and I talk about that a lot on my channel, my YouTube channel. But so you got, uh, you have the seven weeks, so it's 49 uh, days. The 50th day is the feast of uh, weeks, uh, the festival of the first fruits of wheat, which is also the first day of the next 49 days, the next seven weeks. And then the 50th day, the day after that, is the Festival of the First Fruits of Wine, which is also the first day of the next 49 days, the next seven weeks. And then the 50th day, the day after the 49th, is the final First Fruits Day, First Fruits of Oil. So it's 49, or seven weeks, followed by 49 days, seven weeks, followed by 49 days, seven weeks. So principle of seven, again, it's the seven-fold principle. So then you have the, there's seven years, and the seventh year is the Sabbath year. Then you have um, the, set, you know, so you have that, just like, just like there's seven days, and then together, seven days forms a week. Seven years with the Sabbath year, together it forms a, 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 year week it's called a year week or a week of years so then in a jubilee there's seven year weeks so there's 49 years just like there's 49 days in seven weeks and for those for those festival of first fruits it has that cycle of 49 49 49 days and seven weeks in the same way you got 
49 years and seven year weeks or weeks of years. And then it becomes, it's the Jubilee and the 50th year, just like the first fruits. It's the year of Jubilee, but it's also the first year of the next Jubilee cycle. So this is a principle that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's seen throughout these documents of the sevenfold principle. It divides into seven. If you have a, if you have 50 years instead of 49 for a jubilee, it throws off the seven cycle. Now, according to the Masoretic text, I believe they base it on 50. So they say, um, they basically say that um, it was the 50th jubilee, but it was 50 years for jubilee. So they say, the, they entered the promised land in the year 2500 instead of the year 2450. So Jubilee has 2450, and I believe uh, Masoretic has calculates it as 2500 when when they enter the promised land. You just double check that. Um, Yeah, so uh, so according to according to this, yeah, it's it's uh, twenty five hundred. Um, so that's pretty much pretty much the uh, presentation. Um, if you want, though, quickly just uh, go to Book of Daniel, Chapter 9, just so we can look and see that it is talking about the Messiah. So we have, uh, if you go down a little bit where it's, let's see, where does it start? This isn't quite the best because you have, like, barely a verse in the screen. Yeah. Um That's better. All right. So uh, let's see. Go to uh, search uh, for week, the word week. That'll bring us down to where it is. Okay. So, so like verse two. All right, uh, 24. So if you want, yeah, so bring 24 to the down. There we go. All right, so 70 weeks are determined for your, for your holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What does that sound like to you guys? That sounds like Yeshua doing his atonement, right? Um, know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until, it says Messiah, the prince, the text says, until the anointed prince. Of course, the word anointed can mean the Messiah. So um, the interpretation seems to be the Messiah or the anointed prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And so remember, uh, the Jews to the Messiah said it took 46 years to build the temple. Well, according to the general language, temple includes the entire uh, area of the temple, which which the city of Jerusalem was regarded as part of the temple in um, like much of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, so, um, so seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Okay, then go to verse, uh, now show 26 at the top. After the 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off, but not for himself. Uh, there are some translation differences in like the Jewish Bibles. They try to translate it differently to hide the, not intentionally, but it kind of obfuscates the Messiah reference. Um, but in the, in the 
the way it's translated here, the anointed one shall be cut off not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it will, will be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So basically, uh, the Messiah came to bring a new covenant. And so he confirmed the new covenant or a covenant with many for one week. Uh, but in the middle of that week, uh, he was killed. And remember when the veil was torn? The veil was a sign of judgment that they were that their sacrifices were being rejected because they killed the Messiah. Because they killed the Messiah, their sacrifices were now repugnant to the Creator. They didn't become repugnant because it was like, well, now that the Messiah died, now you don't need sacrifice anymore. That's not what it's about, in my view, in my belief. Sacrifices were not taken away because we didn't need them anymore. Instead, they were taken away because they became so evil and polluted by what they had done to the Messiah, they were no longer worthy to sacrifice anymore. And their judgment was nigh. Their, their condemnation was about to come. And so... There's passages in the Old Testament which says their Sabbaths will be taken away as punishment. Their, their priesthood will be taken away as punishment. So this whole thing, it's, it's not because he didn't want those things anymore. It's because they were so evil that they didn't have a right to do those things anymore. They didn't have a right to serve as priests because of how uh, evil they had been to the Messiah and to the people. And so because of that, the sacrifices were taken away uh, in, at that time when the Messiah died. Because they're blood, they had blood on their hands. And priests who have blood on their hands are not allowed to sacrifice. And yet they continue to sacrifice. So their sacrifices were polluted and unholy for that reason. And, and so um, they were basically considered abominations in the eyes of, of Yahweh. And then, and then uh, shortly after, like it says, uh, Where was it? Oh, yeah. Verse 26, it says, till the end of the war. You know, right around that time, they started fighting a war with Ro the Romans, which ended in the destruction of the temple. And it became desolate. And so, even until the consummation, the consummation refers to the very end, um, I, I, if I understand correctly. So, the consummation, uh, until the end, it'll be desolate. And it has been desolate this whole time. So Daniel clearly is prophesying 10 jubilees to the time of the Messiah dying. But the Messiah dies in the middle of the, of the week. Um, so like I said, you just backtrack. 10 jubilees, 10 jubilees, 10 jubilees, 49 jubilees, and you're at the year of creation. And that pretty much is... Uh, the principle scripture I see that scripture says. So hopefully that guys, uh, hopefully that helps you guys uh, make sense of the chronology. Oh, and there was a, one other thing that I remember now. I was trying to remember, I couldn't remember. Finally, I remember. the The later writings of the New Testament suggest that there's just as there's seven days of a week, and the first six days God worked, and the seventh day He rested, Sabbath, in the same way. As a day, so is a thousand years in the eyes of, y of Yahweh. Jubilees also says that as well, by the way. Uh, Jubilees says a thousand years is a day. Um, and so, six days of what? Six days of fighting or doing the work to fight against the acts of Satan. And then what happens in the final 1,000 years? We rest from Satan for the final 1,000 years. Because guess what? During that final thousand years, Satan is bound, according to the book of Revelation. He's bound so that he can't harm people anymore. For a thousand years, we have rest. We don't have to worry about fighting against, working against Satan. So the millennial kingdom, it's called. And that's the book of Revelation that talks about it. It's a final one thousand year period, it says. 
which is to come after the Antichrist stuff happens. So during that 1,000 years, it'll be peace and rest and joy. So you got the first six days or the first 6,000 years, and then you have the 1,000 years. And so the early New Testament writings, there's some extra books in the New Testament which share this idea, like the Epistle of Barnabas says, that's it, it says, it talks about the Sabbath, and then says the Sabbath, the, the type of the Sabbath is the, the thousand year reign at the end and the six days of the 6,000 years. So the Messiah will come back after 6,000 years. So all we have to do is look at the different versions of scripture, look at the chronology, and see uh, how far back the year of creation is, and then add 6,000 years, and that, that's when the Messiah is going to come back. So when we do that, Septuagint, 6,000 years long since passed. So either the 6,000-year theory is not true, or Septuagint is not true because it doesn't agree with the 6,000-year theory. I go with the Septuagint is an error on this. So 6,000-year uh, theory does not work in the Septuagint. In fact, because of the 6,000-year theory, around 500 AD, a lot of Christians believed the Messiah was coming back and they were looking for his return. But he wouldn't. He didn't come because the Septuagint was not correct. Samaritan uh, also has um, the Samaritan six thousand years has passed already, so Samaritan cannot be the correct uh, chronology in everything. Jubilees agrees with Samaritan in chapter five, but completely disagrees with chapter eleven. So therefore, Samaritan as a whole, Samaritan chronology doesn't work. Masoretic doesn't work because the 6,000th year view, uh, actually, wait, let me rephrase. Um, the traditional way of counting the, the Masoretic doesn't work because they dated to 4,004 around BC. However, Masoretic is only off from the Jubilees count by about 50 years or so. So because of that, um, I think the Masoretic actually has not reached uh, uh, 6,000 years yet either. So the Jubilees count and the Masoretic have not reached 6,000 yet. So based on the 6,000-year theory, Masoretic could be correct chronology or Jubilees could be correct chronology. Um, but going, I, I go with the Jubilees one for all the reasons I mentioned in this. I think Jubilees has the more accurate readings and it agrees with the Samaritan for chapter 5. It more, makes more sense. And overall, Jubilee's uh, chronology makes more sense. So you got people who say Jubilee's should be rejected because he disagrees with the chronology of Genesis. If you hear someone say that, tell them Genesis disagrees with the chronology of Genesis because the different copies of Genesis disagree with each other. So which version does Jubilee's disagree with? You know, or which version does it agree with? So you have to keep that in mind when you're critiquing these other documents. It's not fair to reject Jubilees by not by being ignorant of the different versions of Genesis. You have to understand the different versions of Genesis before you can say Jubilees contradicts chronology of Genesis. Once you see the chronology of Genesis differs in those three versions, now Jubilees chronology can fit Genesis. With that in mind, um, so, let's see, so yeah, seven thousand theory. Uh, I, I believe in it. Thousand year theory. Um, okay, uh, the Messiah will come back. Come on, I'm waiting for this. Oh, right. the six thousand year theory. Uh, I conclude that the Messiah will come back in this roughly the six thousandth year, uh, which is which according to this chronology is about 150 years from now so around 2170 ish is when 
each 6,000th year in this chronology occurs. So I don't believe that Messiah is coming back for another 150 years. A lot of people think he's coming sooner. But I think you're going to see your live your lifetime and he won't come back. But don't lose faith because the 6,000th year hasn't come yet. Alexar says, so is there a version of in, in English that is more closer to the original? Or should he, uh, or should he learn the Hebrew language? Um, so oh, right, one other thing, uh, I'm going to answer that. But one other thing, um, you know how I said 480 years uh, after the Exodus? The Septuagint says 440 years. So that's another difference right there. That's confusing. But the reason for that, 440, could be due to the interpretation that they wandered in the desert for 40 years. So 440 plus 40 years of wandering is 480. So you could see that. Anyways, um, so, uh, so basically all we have right now is translation of the Masoretic, English translation, Translation of the Septuagint, English translation, and we have translation of the Samaritan Torah, English. That's the best we can do right now. We also have English translation of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you can look at those English translations. But we don't have, beyond that, we don't have anything uh, yet. So I would recommend definitely looking at, uh, my recommendation is Brenton Septuagint. It uses translation close to the King James style. Uh, so people who like King, King James Version, go with the Brenton Septuagint. I would also recommend the Nets translation of the Septuagint, N-E-T-S. And uh, that one, uh, it has more updated language, but it also has some variants not in the Brenton Version, which are important. So both, I recommend both those for the Septuagint. Masoretic, you can basically stick with King James Version. That's essentially Masoretic. You're not going to find much different for Masoretic readings, depending what you're looking at. But if you want like a perfect version of that, you could you could uh, get one of the Jewish uh, translations um, by the by the Orthodox Jews or where they will translate the Masoretic text without Christian bias at all. Um, there's a few verses in the Old Testament which are actually translated uh, with from the Christian interpretation, like Virgin, uh, Isaiah 7, 14. In the King James Version, says Virgin. Uh, regular Jewish translation is not going to say Virgin. And uh, Pierced by Hands and Feet, I think uh, regular Hebrew translations from the orthodox jews are going to say like a lion my hand and feet. so there's a couple things like that but for the most part you're getting the masoretic text when you have the king james version hopefully that helps and and i am in the process of making a version which reconstructs uh the original text and provides septuagint and masoretic and tries to make sense of the variants so I'm working on it, uh, but for now, just stick with those English translations. JC says, what about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Um, so Dead Sea Scrolls themselves do not, I'm not sure what this was being, uh, in what context that this was asked, but I'm going to assume that it's talking about uh, the different variants of the numbers. The Dead Sea Scrolls, unfortunately, they're fragmentary. So for this, for chapter 5 and chapter 11, we don't have any fragments of those chapters that pre preserve enough text to uh, provide another witness on the different variants for the, for the numbers, unfortunately. Um, but overall, the Dead Sea Scrolls like, are very significant for the variants they have in all kinds of verses. Or just says, didn't the Masoretes add vowels and change the language and add titles like Adonai? Yes, so the um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls also adds vowels, but in a different way. So vowels are added for interpretation purposes. 
And so keep in mind that a lot of the things we have in modern times, they did not have. They did not have periods, punctuation. They did not have commas, semicolons. They did not have parentheses. They did not have, um, let's see, uh, I don't think they had question marks. Um, they, let's see, what else did they not have? Um, verse numbers. They didn't have verse numbers, didn't have chapters. So where did a word begin? And sometimes it's not clear. Where did a sentence end? It was not always clear. So because they wanted people to understand, what's the job of a scribe? The, the job of a scribe is to convey to others how to understand something, um, like a translation, for example. When you're translating a text, you want the reader to be able to understand it, right? In the same way, when you're making a copy for public use, when you're making a copy for study purposes, it needs to be able to be read by people. So in order to be read by people, there are certain interpretive things that need to be done sometimes. And because of that, they add vowels to give those interpretations. Now, the Orthodox Jews or the Masoretes, they added vowel marks like little dots, right? But the Dead Sea Scrolls, instead, they add what's called... Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank what it's called at the moment. But basically, it's a special thing that goes back quite a ways in time in the history of the Hebrew language where the original spelling did not have those vowels, but they add those vowels for uh, pronunciation helping. So for example, um, the word for Moses, uh, Moshe, there's no wa there. There's no O in the actual text, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it adds a wa, which is, which is the equivalent of an O. So they add, in some manuscripts, fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have that vowel added, wa. So moshe, or musha, or moshe. Same thing with the word Elohim. In the regular Hebrew text, the original spelling, you don't have wa there. You basically have Elohim, Elohim, ah. But it also becomes an O sound, or like, okay, so... In English, we have the, the letter O, right? How do you pronounce the letter O? There's different ways. You can pronounce it as a O, long O, like a cold, hold, nose, O, right? But you could also have an ah sound, like hot, cot, shot, log, bog, right? Ah. Then you can have a U sound, like the word D-O, do. How are you doing? U. And then you can have an uh sound like the word onion, onion, O-N-I-O-N. Each O has an uh sound, like, like a, U, a U-H, uh. And so the um, so what we see is that, like for Elohim, it actually would be E-L-O-H-I-M, and it would be originally pronounced Elohim, but later on, they started pronouncing it with an O sound, Elohim. But like I said, originally it was like an ah, just like the O can have an ah sound, but it can also have an O sound. Uh, so originally it would have been pronounced more like an ah, and then it later became an O. But so for Elohim or Elohim, it, the original text does not have a wa, but the Dead Sea Scrolls adds a wa. But guess what? The Masoretes, they add the O sound with a vowel mark. So they're both adding an, the O or A ah sound in different ways. One adds the vowel mark for that sound. The other adds the, the letter, uh, the actual letter. And they say Yod was also added to for the same reason. And Aleph sometimes is added for a similar reason of adding a sound and also for interpretive pur purposes. So... Um, uh, so, but, uh, so they didn't really change the language in the sense of adding, like they basically were preserving for later people, their dialect or their language. It would be like, um, it would be like if I was spelling, uh, actually, I don't want to say that. 
but like it would be kind of more like uh, the difference between color and honor in American English versus uh, British uh, English, where they use a U over there, but over here we don't use a U, but it's pronounced the same. Um, and but for, for for titles, yeah. So the the they changed Yahweh to be pronounced as Adonai. So the, so the vowels are not Jehovah or Yehovah. Uh, instead, those vowels are telling them to say it as if the word is Adonai, because they don't they believe it's wrong to say Yahweh or Yahuwah or Yua or however you say it. One John two twenty six is the he, he said it's the fiftieth not fifty yeah. ninth is the fiftieth year, the year of jubilee, the first. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So that must have been asked earlier on because I did I did clarify that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless he didn't realize the clarification, but yeah. So it's the first year of the next forty nine years, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and according to the. Uh, principle of the divisibility by seven, which we see in the Book of Enoch, like I said, uh, 364 days. It's a principle of seven. So that principle of seven must not be violated. And it, it go it works with uh, in the Temple Scroll, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has um, three Feast of Weeks where it's 49 days, followed by 49 days, followed by 49 days. And in each of those, the day after the 49th day, is the first of the next 49, but it's also a, a first fruits festival. So. You may have answered this too. I'm not sure. Is the last part of that verse supposed to have been breathed? I'm not sure which verse. Oh, wait. Okay. I'm not sure which verse that is. So uh, you'll have to, he can have to ask that again. And then like if he gives, if he gives the verse number. So uh, Alex R says, so how old is Earth now? Um, so we have two possibilities here. Uh, so according to the, so here's what we, what we do know is that Genesis and Jubilees, Jubilees, by the way, gives the same creation account, roughly the same creation account as Genesis. So there's seven days. The first... The first, uh, basically, the days of Genesis do not match with what science science or the evolutionists say. It doesn't work. So either evolutionists are wrong or the Bible's wrong, or there's a middle ground approach where, so basically, a day, according to scripture, a day is when the sun goes around one whole cycle. But what happened before the sun was made? Right? What happened before the sun was made? So the sun was made on the fourth day. The third day is when plants came into existence. So if there was still light on the third day, then plants may have potentially, I don't actually believe this, but I'm just giving it as a possibility, but plants may have lived for many, many millions of years or whatever, whatever you want to say, right? And then... Um, the fourth day is when the sun and moon came about. And then again, those might, that might've been like millions of years or whatever you want to claim. Again, I don't believe that, but I'm just giving that as a thing. But then the fifth day, the sixth and the sixth day just don't work with, um, with uh, evolution. So the Bible is either wrong or evolutionists are wrong uh, because it's clear that those are 24 hour days uh, for, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly 24 hours, but it's clear it's a short day for the fifth and sixth day and the seventh day. But according to the book of Jubilees, it tells us that um, it basically tells us that the first seven days were regular days because it says, Adam was created in the, uh, let me pull it up. Um, it says, uh, 
In the first week was Adam created, and the rib his wife, and in the second week he showed her unto him. So what that says is that in the first seven days, Adam was created, and in the second seven days, uh, she was shown to, to him. And then it says, and for this reason the commandment was given to keep in their defilement for a male seven days, for a female twice seven days. Because that's in the book of Leviticus. And after Adam had completed 40 days in the land, he was brought into the Garden of Eden. And it says, if she bears a male, she shall remain in her uncleanness seven days according to the first week, first week of days. And if it's a female child, she shall remain in her uncleanness two weeks of days, according to the first two weeks. So Jubilees makes it pretty clear that uh, the, the first two weeks, or the, the week of creation, is a regular week, um, at least according to Jubilees' testimony. But, like I said, if there, there's some believers who are hung up on the, the evolution thing, or, or the, the old earth view, so for those people... If it's a choice between accepting the Bible, or no, if it's a choice between rejecting the Bible or believing that the earth is old, then believe the earth is old so you can still accept the Bible. But you cannot really twist the creation of animals to agree with what evolutionists say. It's no, there's no way around it. The Bible is completely at odds with much of evolutionary theory. And uh, at best, I would say that the earth, like on the first day, the first day, nothing else was created, just the earth and the heavens. Um, and the second, no, let's see. And the second day, the sky was created and the, and the waters, right? So the first two days work, work pretty much fine with, a, with very long days. And they could be, it could be like, you know, a day is when it revolves around one whole time. So it's possible that the first two days were extremely long, millions and millions, maybe billions of years, right? And then once everything was formed, then the third day happened. But guess what? Plants being made before the sun doesn't make much sense if you think about it. But that's what Genesis says. Plants came before the sun. So because of that, the third day almost certainly is a regular 24-hour day and the fourth day as well and onwards. So you kind of it's kind of puts your faith to the test. Do you go with what the evolutionists say or do you go with what scripture says? For me, I'm gonna go with what scripture says because so much of their science is unproven, especially the fact that uh they've been proven wrong so many times. They've said animals have gone extinct and then they find the animals still existing. And they change the, the age of the universe so many times. They'll say, yeah, the universe is this number of years old. And then a, a couple, you know, 10 years later, oh, actually we were wrong. It was much older. Whoops. Um, and they'll say all kinds of weird things. Like they'll say, oh, so you know how we said humans did this a certain number of years ago? Well, actually it was far older than that. Like and they keep, they keep every now and then I'll see an article which says we were wrong about this. Da, da, da. So I don't have a lot of faith in their ideas. And, and one of the interesting things is like the way they base dating methods is very questionable because it implies a consistent uh, pattern, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, so like, like uh, what do you call it? Um, decay, whatever you call those things, De decay things where uh, – after something dies, it like half life or whatever, and the same thing for like rock specimens and things like that. There's like half lives. The problem is we don't know if the rules around half lives were always consistent in all circumstances, especially if um, the like before the flood things were very different, right? People lived much longer. Um. And the atmosphere is different. So maybe half-lives behave very different before the flood. We have no proof. And we have actually found things where in modern times, something forms instantly. And when they date it using those methods, it dates millions of years old, even though we saw it form right before our eyes. So 
there's a lot of holes and flaws with uh, evolutionary ideas in that sense. So I, I wouldn't lose my faith over the Bible contradicting evolution. I would just side with the Bible, but still be open-minded to what the scientists say, because you know maybe they have proof, but they, they haven't really shown overwhelming proof, in my opinion. So. One John two twenty six. They say that this is the Jewish year of fifty seven eighty two. If creation was thirty seven sixty one, are you adding about a hundred years onto this? The way I understand you, I don't think Yeshua is hundreds of years away. Um, so it's not quite a hundred years, but it's like uh, I add like uh, it's like. Um, uh, well, something else, interestingly, so the 7,000-year theory, according to Jubilees, the fall of Adam happened seven years after creation. So seven, the seven plus 7,000, because, you know, 7,000-year theory. So if you start the 7,000-year theory from the fall of Adam, which according to Jubilees was seven, seven years, so seven plus seven thousand is seven thousand seven. When you divide seven thousand and seven by forty-nine, it's perfectly divisible into jubilees. It's one hundred and forty-three jubilees. If you didn't have that extra seven years prior to the fall of Adam, it wouldn't perfectly fit into the jubilees. Seven thousand years doesn't work, but seven thousand seven does, and jubilees says they were in the garden for seven years. So that's a cool uh, correspondence there as well. Um, but uh, so basically the problem with the Jewish year is they calculated the year using a flawed interpretation of Daniel, the book of Daniel. See, they based the book of Daniel prophecy, chapter 9, on the fulfillment of was not the Messiah, Yeshua. The fulfillment was um, the fulfillment was what's it called? Uh, when the temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD. So that's that's 40 years off right there. Okay. The second thing that's off is they don't date it from the building of um they're, they're, they're not dating it from the building of the, so it says from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Which decree is it? It's actually the decree of Artaxerxes. It's, but the Jews interpreted it as a decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. So that's significantly earlier. But it's 490 years. So they subtracted the 490 years and so they said 490 years before the year 70 AD is the year um, is is the year uh, when the uh, second temple started to be built. But this is off by about a hundred years, and so. Um, because of this, uh, it's called the it's called the missing Jewish years. Uh, could you look that up for a sec on Wikipedia? The missing Jewish years in Wikipedia. Uh, what, what what about the very top? What does it say at the very top? Chronological discrepancy between the rabbinic dating for the destruction of the first temple in 423 BC and the academic dating of it in 587 BC. So you take 70 AD, subtract 90 years. Sorry, my uh, my um. My audio or my screen is being slow again. 
Um, but you take 70 AD, subtract 490 years with the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and it brings it to the, to the decree. They think it's the decree of Cyrus. They're dating the decree of uh, sorry again about the uh, this delay in, in my video. So, um, okay, dating in traditional Jewish sources. That's where we go. Um, but so traditional Jewish date recognized by the rabbis as the year of destruction is approximately 165 years later than the accepted year of 587 or 586 BC. This discrepancy is referred to as the missing years. Um, but yeah, so, so, uh, can you show that earlier comment from... You don't have to share this window anymore. You can get out of it. But uh, what was the... Okay, so... Um, so they're saying 5782. So yeah, it's off like by almost... Uh, let's see, how, how many years here? So, um, so I said the year of creation was about 3838. So 2021, you add that together, we're, we're around approximately like around 5859 or 5860. So you compare 5860 to 5782, uh, that's about 80 years difference. So, so according to 7,000 year theory, the, what the Jews say is the, is the Jewish year we're all we're over 200 years away from the messiah coming back uh so my chronology makes it not as far away more like 150 years but it's still quite a long time so a lot of people believe that that that's too far away they think it'll happen in our lifetime that he'll come back but there's still a lot of stuff that needs to happen um the temple hasn't been built yet there's a document in the dead sea schools called the war scroll if that's a prophecy that has not happened, that war has not happened yet. It's a 40 year long war. So that war has definitely not happened. Um, and there's still a lot of things that need to, to change for the system, the Antichrist system to be set up in my view. So I, I personally think it's not gonna happen in our lifetimes. You see, the thing is every, t every generation, we have people who believe it's their generation. And all the way back to the Messiah, we've, we've, we've had these people who believe that. Every significant time that's come, like the year 500, the year when the year 1000 came, people gathered and believed it was the time of the end. Um, and so, you know, in the year 2000, you know, the millennium, when, you know, there was the whole Y2K scare and everything, people were thinking the end was coming. 2018, or no, was it 2012? 2012, the whole Mayan calendar thing and and um and then there was that thing what was that guy i don't know there was that uh camp guy or something i forget his name but uh Harold camping yeah and he predicted something it didn't happen and then he said oh it was a secret thing or something like that and then he said but it's gonna happen six months from now or a year from now or something and people waited again and it still didn't happen so this happens you know, people keep making predictions and the predictions keep failing. My prediction is unique in that I'm not dating it conveniently in my time. You know, I people want them to, him to return in your, in your time. So you're, you're more prone to date it to your time. But I'm dating it 150 years from now, which if I'm right, I probably won't be alive for that. Never say never. You know, maybe there'll be a miracle and I'll still be alive, but probably not. Right. So. 
but yeah. So the Tower of Time, uh, Genesis, oh, he said uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, for the question of uh, is the last part of that verse supposed to be have been breathed instead of rested? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says. Yeah, go to blue letter. Yeah. So Tower Time is uh, uh, joining me on Hebrew stuff, like uh, in my Hebrew lessons that I've been doing on my channel. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so cl click 2-7 to show the Hebrew. You mean the interlinear? Um, yeah. Okay, so... And then, okay, let me see the English at the top a little bit. Okay, formed. All right, you can go down. And, and, uh, okay, uh, so, so scroll down to the actual, like, uh, the words in the bottom where it shows, like, the different, how they're translating it here. So, the dust. Okay, keep going. All right, it's breathed. So it's not. They're taking it from Napa. Uh, go down a little bit more. What's the next? Into his nostrils and with the breath, nashim, of life. Okay, so so click click that word um, up above the um, not that one, but the one above it. Napa. The breathed. Yeah, Napa. 5301 so click click 5301 yeah um so this one i mean it says it says i don't i don't see anything about rest here so i'm not sure does the septuagint say that or something does it say rest or what makes you think it was uh, rest uh we'll see if he says why he thinks that uh oh can you can you pull up the septuagint just to see if it says something yeah. different there um let's see genesis chapter 2 verse 7 oh, right there yeah, so I don't I don't know why you're saying you were saying rest. You know, it's just it's just uh, it's it's the word for breathe. Wait, so that way that that that's the Septuagint. Are you? Or? Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, Brenton Septuagint on okay. uh, Bible Hub. Yeah, it doesn't sh it doesn't show me the Brenton thing. That's why I couldn't tell. Yeah, if you go, uh, let me see. If you go up to the top here. It says Brenton Septuagint. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. So 1 John 2.26 says, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says the earth was void, but I th I was taught that it became void in the Hebrew, uh, that there was another earth age before this one. Uh, so, okay, so um, that's a popular view, but something to keep in mind in Hebrew is they don't have really past tense, present, or future. So what they have is something called perfect and imperfect, where basically... Um, the same verb, depending on context, it can it can be any time. It could be past, present, or future. So to kind of explain that, like, so you to use a few uh, words here, like let's say you did something in the past, right? So you you would say, um, okay, uh, let, let's just say the the verb love. So there's two basic forms of love. There's loved and love. Okay, loved and love. So if you're saying loved, that would be the perfect. It's complete. And so what you would say is, you could say, I had loved, as in you had loved in the past. It would be something you did in the past. I had loved. Or 
I have loved, uh, so I had loved, I have loved, as in you have loved in the moment something, or I will have loved something I will completely love in the future. And then you also have uh, love. So I did love something you did in the past. You, you loved something in the past. So I did love. I do love something you currently do love. And then I will love something you will love. So, uh, so when it's, if it, if it says it became void or it was void, it doesn't like, however it's worded, it doesn't mean a tense of time. It just means, it either means, um, it either means, it means it was void or it means it had been void or it means uh let's see uh what did i say well the problem is void is not a verb um like you know my example was did do and will do uh or or will but um basically it's 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 just uh it's either saying it it was void or uh it had been void like something along those lines like it, it it, it was being void or it had been void like it's it's not uh necessarily saying that like like there's no reason to think it was saying it wasn't void and became void it's just void was that's what it's saying it void was at that time Void was there. Uh, that's basically what it's saying, in my understanding. You ever um, the Safari uh, translation of that verse um, puts it this way, and they got an ex they got a, a, an explanation of it. They said that it should say, "When God created the heaven and earth, the earth was uh, being unformed and void." There is a long explanation to that as well, but that's the way they put it. Interesting. Yeah, so um, okay, I think we got all the, the questions and comments. If, if anybody has any more questions, please submit it um, at Onia on, in the live chat. And we'll get to that before we close. I'm, I'm going to just skim through stuff. Uh, yeah. But like, it's hard to tell like, okay, so it's, it starts at the bottom. The, the bottom yeah. is the latest one. No, I mean, I mean, uh, n like, okay, I'm just seeing like, there's a lot of messages. Let's see. Well, yeah, so uh, while I'm looking at this stuff, um, all right, here, here's one. Um, it's kind of in the beginning where JC2205 is disagreeing regarding the Septuagint. 193452 um i think is this one it right here yes yeah okay yeah so um this understanding is similar to the, the king james version being divinely inspired translation so there's a couple things about the story first of all the evidence indicates to us that the these original septuagint was just the law of Moses. It was just the five books. It was not the entire Old Testament. So this this story of the 70 men separated 
to make it what actually only applies to the five books. It doesn't apply to any of the later books of the Old Testament. Um, so even if this story is, is the divine inspiration, it would only be to the Torah and not to the other books of the Old Testament. However, um, it's it doesn't seem like this is what uh, is this that this is. Uh, this seems to be a, a like a later elaboration of what the original story was. So I do believe that there were 70 or 72 men who were scribes and who all helped create the version. But, you know, five, five books, that takes a lot of time to make it, right? So they probably were dividing them to different sections where they worked on it together. Um, and then maybe some of them worked on the same thing different versions and they compared them and then uh and the uh copy that they agreed upon together they chose um and then later legend uh confused the fact that they had separate they, they had separate writing places and so i think the whole story of the fact that they uh originated uh, diff, like independently the same text I think that's a later story that's probably not original like a legend that developed um, but Letter of Aristius I trust Letter of Aristius so look at what Letter of Aristius says regarding the Septuagint uh, translation of the law so that's what I would say um, but the Septuagint cannot be divinely inspired because there's so many errors in falsehoods in it, unfortunately. Um, you know, you're talking to someone that I used to put the Septuagint like super high, like supreme value. I was even saying some like that it might be even more reliable sometimes than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but I've kind of toned down some of my adherence to the Septuagint just because I've, as I've learned more, about Hebrew and how variants come to be, I've come to realize that a lot of the variants in the Septuagint make more sense as being corruptions or added for clarification purposes or whatnot. But then other variants, I'm still very much inclined to agree with Septuagint. So you got to do case by case basis, but in no way can I believe that the Masoretic text, Septuagint or Samaritan, or even the Dead Sea Scrolls is the original text and divinely inspired and perfect. I think all of them have problems. They all have false readings, errors, whatever, you know? So. Okay. Um, so while I'm looking for anything else, um, how, what did you guys think of uh, what I shared? Christopher, you know, you could share, share your thoughts. And, of course, uh, anyone else uh, who like wants to, sh to share how they, what they thought of what I shared. Like, was it compelling or did you find it uh, to be not convincing for whatever reasons? And if you want, you can share why, what particular reason you still think differently. Um, but uh, could, could you do 1954-11? No, I got different, a little bit different time. Oh. Is this Fortis? Uh, yeah, is it's, it, is it's the Book the, of Jubilee to divide it? Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, Jubilees. Uh, so, Nag Hammadi is a group of Christian writings, uh, mainly Gnostic documents, um, or at least in the form they currently existed in that li library of scrolls. Uh, they are Gnostic writings. Uh, Jubilees is from Jewish times. It's not Christian document, although Christians later regarded it as scripture. Some of them, like the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, they still do. It's in their Bibles. But uh, uh, Jubilees is a very much a Jewish writing, and it's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, it, and we do have fragments of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and therefore it is in B.C. times that we know for a fact it's written before the Messiah.
yeah so I'm, I'm gonna be looking for some oh yeah there's not too much more here but uh yeah do you guys have any reactions to what i have shared i think it was just absolutely awesome um definitely going to be listening to this again myself um very very good At this point, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't have anything that I would say that, you know, I, I can't say I disagree with this because of this. I, I, I just think it was uh, it's just an awesome uh, presentation for sure. It, uh, the, so what's your, what's your thought on, uh, on the variants of like, you know, how wildly different they are? Like, uh, do you, what, what readings do you think we should go with? Uh, you know, I, I think that as far as I understand, I'm pretty much right where you are. I think that, uh, the variants, um, really helped to strengthen my faith as opposed to shake it because it's like, it makes you want to dig deeper. It makes you want to find the truth. It makes you want to, to trace where these variants started and how they got there. And I think what the more you see the more you, the more you see, the more you learn about it, the more you understand and the more stronger your faith gets. Yeah. And as, uh, one John says 21, 20, 47 near the top, uh, the historical data may vary. Okay. There. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. You know, um, so we got to keep in mind that all right, so while the historical data may vary, the theology of salvation doesn't. So this, I want to share with you guys something that, you know, you might not hear a lot, but this is uh, something I've actually shared with people because a lot of people say they don't care about extra books of Scripture be because we have all we need to be – we have all that we need for salvation in the Bible. However, you could argue we might not actually, but secondly – to be fair, there is like a concept that we don't need the Bible at all to be saved. If we didn't have the Bible at all, would that mean we can't be saved? No. You know, it might be harder because we might not know as many truths that we might need to know. But Scripture itself says, uh, do not say that the law is over there, that you cannot do it. It is with you in your heart that you may do it. And... Paul actually applies that to faith. He says, do not say it is too hard, you know, too far away. But, but the word, he applies that to the Messiah. The word is in your heart that you may be saved. Uh, so it's not somewhere far off. It's within your reach. No matter where you are, no matter what the case is, you can be saved. You don't need the Bible to be saved. But it help, certainly helps to have the more of his word that we have, the more it can help point you to salvation. But at the same time, a lot of scripture just isn't important for salvation. So let me give some examples. Song of Solomon. This is a song that Solomon wrote about uh, his love life, you know. Um, then you have David's, you know, he's worshiping God. You know, that's, that's great. He's worshiping, but um, it, it can give us pictures of, of how to worship, but it's not like a salvation issue stuff, you know. Um, Book of Esther, at least in the Masoretic, it doesn't mention God at all once, nothing about religion at all. Uh, then you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, did you know in there's nothing in Mark that's not in the other two Gospels? So we don't need Mark. And then uh, really you could just pick one of the Gospels and reject the other Gospels. And then, uh, you know, you could start whittling stuff away. Like uh, Kings and Chronicles, huge overlap. And likewise, um, uh, First and Second Samuel overlaps with Chronicles pretty well, but uh, you know, you could pretty much you know say Chronicles, yeah. And then uh, a lot of the prophecies, prophecies are mainly historically based, like prophecies against nations at that time period, like in Jeremiah and stuff, like against Babylon and Edom and things like that. 
these prophecies have already been fulfilled. And then there's there's historical narratives, which are interesting, but do they really affect our salvation? You know, Joshua, you know, the history of Joshua. And and, uh, and if you want to go back to Genesis, you know, <clears throat> what does it matter if uh, when things were created or what Abraham did or Noah or, you know, what, what do all these things matter? It, it doesn't matter in terms of salvation. You know, you can be saved regardless of the, the historical past. But these, you know, it's it's basically more in line with a duty towards truth and also preserving righteousness and modeling the, our lives after these ancient people. But in general, we're just supposed to learn history just for the sake of learning history. And this is divine history, so we should be learning about the divine history. But it's like, uh, you know... I don't study scripture and value it so much because I think if I don't know these things, then then I won't be saved. But I I I study it with the goal of trying to make myself more wise and more knowledgeable, and and just the fact that like I'm honoring my ancestors. You know, we're supposed to be honoring our forefathers. How do you honor your father and mother by preserving their memory? So how do we preserve the memory? By studying the past, sharing, learning about their heritage and, and what they've passed down to us, and then preserving it for future generations. And uh, so, uh, but things like this study that we did, you know, the chronology thing, it's important for some reasons because people use history to base their beliefs on things. Like they'll reject the Bible because of history. They'll reject the Book of Jubilees because they say it contradicts the chronology, uh, things like that. So studies like this are important to reject certain doctrines. But they're not important so that you, in order to be saved, but they're important to refute falsehoods that people are teaching. So in terms of refuting false teaching, they're very important, uh, even stuff like this. And so you know, you know how it says Scripture was given... Uh, Paul says uh, every word or whatever, or, you know, all scripture. No, he doesn't say word, but all scripture is given and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Thoroughly equipped, blah, blah, blah. So it's like we're being equipped to refute false teachings and to support true teachings. The more we study these variants, it bolsters us into the truth and helps us to reject falsehood. And so that's what's important about this. Not it's not about, oh, no, was Adam 130 or was he 230? Oh, uh, this could ruin my salvation. You know, you know it doesn't, if you choose to believe 230 instead of 130, your salvation is not at risk. But your ability to properly interpret scripture may be at risk if you're going with the wrong chronology. Um, I'm just looking at the most recent. Okay. Oh, it looks like you received a hundred messages today. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, does that happen pretty much every time or how does that? Uh, pretty much actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I don't have pretty much anything else. Uh, I just say that, there's so much more stuff like this. You guys would be surprised. And and uh, this is just the beginning. There's like, so if you're interested in this type of stuff, you can check out my channel or, you know, I am going to be making a eventually PDFs of the different books of the Old Testament. That's what I'm going to be starting with. And then eventually New Testament as well. And so my goal is making a new version of the Bible uh, using the different manuscripts and then reconstructing some of the texts uh, using different sources and uh, translating it perhaps a little more literally and um, giving footnotes so like that c clarify interesting things you might not be aware of so there's going to be a lot of stuff and, and one of the cool things that I'll be doing is I'll be showing you guys here's the Septuagint 
here's the Masoretic, and here's probably the original Hebrew behind the Septuagint and, and, and why it was translated here this way, the reason for the discrepancy. I'll, I'll try to provide you guys the reason for why there's the discrepancy. And when you see the reasons, it's going to be illuminating to see, oh, okay, that's why this version has that. So... Yeah, so for, um, for people to get... That's my goal. Yeah, go ahead. No, that, that, that's my goal uh, uh, for my version. So I'll be working on, and, and it'll take a while, but uh, eventually it's be ready for the public. It'll probably be a few years, at least for... Uh, for the first few books to start coming out. But what were you going to Yeah, um, sorry about that. I think that there's a little bit of a delay and that's why we kind of overlap a little bit here. But uh, um, for, so for, for people to uh, get more of your content, you know, we th there's your YouTube channel, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls Religion. Uh, you do have um, stuff on Facebook as well. Could you please uh, direct people to those channels? Yes. So, uh, so I have uh, my, my main Facebook account, Onia Safarbal. And uh, that uh, you can find me easily there, but I also have a, a group on Facebook. It's called biblical dead sea scrolls and apocrypha study group. And, so the way it's intended is just for people to share interesting ideas about scripture, uh, including Apocrypha and Dead Sea Scrolls and challenging stuff uh, or things that are like designed to like study variants and things like that, or new interpretations or evidence for scripture being true. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff there, but, that's, where, what, that's often where I post new ideas that I come up with. Uh, my first time sharing things that I've just, you know, something that comes in my head. Instead of posting it on my wall, I post it in my in that group. Unfortunately, the group is kind of stagnant a lot of the time. And I, I also do a strict control to eliminate, uh, eliminate stuff that's irrelevant or not helpful. And one of the things, for example, that I eliminate is like, if someone's like quoting a, like just posting a quote from a scripture, like Book of Enoch or or from the Old Testament or from the New Testament, to me that's not helpful for discussion purposes because you're just quoting the Bible without any context. The context being, what do you want? Why are you showing us showing us this passage? What do you want us to talk about regarding this? So, for me, I feel like that the group is intended for like group study or sharing interesting ideas and theories, but it's not so much for like, it's not so much for like, um, Hey, how you doing? Or like, I have a prayer request or, you know, that type of thing. Um, I think that's better served more for like a one-on-one -on -one in private type of thing or, or on people's walls or whatever. But in terms of like, group focus i try to focus it and and not have all these different crazy stuff uh so that's the idea so how could uh someone get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you uh, i also have an email email address you could email me at uh spell it out o n i e h seven 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 at gmail.com okay and uh we i could come back again sometime if uh christopher wants me back and he could pick the topic whatever and then i i uh i tend to prefer like if i do stuff like this i like to do it every now and then not necessarily every week or you know so some people want to hear from me every week but it's just it can get exhausting i know you you do this what every day yeah yeah so far <laughs> It's it's, <laughs> it's tough. It could be tough. So for me, yeah. I, I have a much easier time. Uh, I feel better 
having gaps in this type of stuff. Uh, so if you want me back, you know, maybe sometime in January, uh, I'm thinking so, but, or, yeah, or, okay. you, or it could be later or whatever, you know, just went whenever you're, if you do, like the best way to put it is don't, uh, just call me on just to have me on, but instead, like if a cool idea comes to your mind, like, Oh, I think that'd be cool to have you on for that. Then shoot, shoot me, uh, the idea and I'd be happy to come on. Sounds great. You know, the Tower of Time, you probably read this, uh, maybe a weekly or bi biweekly discussion here. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll see uh, sometime in, in January for sure. Uh, uh, we'll get you back. I, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I was blessed by what you, sh what you shared, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here. I got a lot more people that listen to this afterwards, the replays, than that are on the uh, live, so... Yeah, so we got uh, one John two twenty six saying thank you so much. This really helped me uh, help me understand the discrepancies and gave me more resources to look at it. Yep, amen. A lot of people and, would find these things tedious, but uh, yeah, the variants. But um, when you start piecing it together and seeing, oh, these things being this way mean that this is the case. Once you start lining it up like that, then it becomes much more uh, important and interesting. Oh, man. Alexa, well, uh, are you guys? He said, uh, one John said, sorry, I, I'm not sure what he's saying. I think that the uh, the spelling of Onia there in the in the previous oh. comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, so we'll wrap it up and definitely, uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll have you back whenever, uh, whenever the time is right. Like I think you say sometime in January. And so I'm, I'm thinking that's a good thing. we we'll can, we can, uh, set a date for that. So those of you who, uh, are, um, still on here, uh, please let Onia know how much you appreciate, um, him coming on here and sharing, Drop a line in the live chat here just before we go off. And also keep in, keep in mind also there is a delay. I think it's at least 10 seconds, sometimes a lot more than that. Sometimes I even up to almost uh, 30 seconds or a minute. So, uh, yes. So thank you very much, Onia. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you've been a great blessing and uh, been a great blessing in my life as well. So I appreciate you. God bless you guys. Hope you have a have a great night and uh, and continue to enjoy the studies of Enoch with Christopher Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the the tower the tower time says yes. Uh, thanks, brothers, for this. We greatly appreciate you both for sharing your time. Kalamentos, thanks again, Onia. Be blessed, Alexar. Shalom, Onia. I appreciate the knowledge and insight you had on, on things. It was very interesting. Blessings. Have a great night. Shalom. 1 John 2.26, L. L. Yon versus YHVH. That's a topic. Yeah, we could do that sometime maybe. Okay. Yeah, we'll set that up and we'll talk about that. Truth will set you free. I know the truth will set you free. I was looking forward to this night as uh, she shared that before. She says, thank you guys. Thank you blessings blessings okay well again thanks onia uh awesome definitely uh lots of food for thought lots of food for study not just thought but for sure and so okay so um yeah one john 226 says thank you both blessings to all all right so anyway have a great weekend guys it. Okay, God bless. Blessings. Okay, so as always, I just want to close out here as usual. Um, it was awesome. A very, very awesome evening for sure. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'll keep in touch with Onia, and we'll set up something in the future, Lord willing, and I'll let you guys know um, what, we, what becomes of it. And uh, as always, tomorrow night, 
um, back here, same time, same place, 7 p.m., picking up with the Book of Enoch, uh, actually talking about the reading the uh, the portion of the Book of Noah within the Book of Enoch. So that's going to be very, very interesting. Okay, guys, as always, I pray for each one of you listening, either live or replay, doesn't matter. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. See you guys tomorrow.